30 in order to give the council an opportunity to uh, interview two candidates for the planning commission, uh, Jordan Truitt and Dan Augustine. And uh, we will commence with that. Uh, first, we'll have the recorder call the roll, please. Councilor Kayser. Present. Councilor Anderson. Likewise. Councilor Nanke. Here. Councilor Leung. Here. Councilor Osik. Here. Councilor Hoy. Here. Councilor Nordyke. Here. Councilor Lewis. Here. Mayor Bennett. Here. Well, we are going to begin uh, with our interviews. I'd first like to let each of you introduce yourselves, uh, maybe give us just a, a brief background and uh, your interest in uh, uh, serving on the uh, Planning Commission. And then the counselors will be asking some uh, questions and I look forward to hearing from each of you. Could we start with you, Jordan? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak, members of the council. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak before you as a candidate for this position. Um, I, I'm a lifelong Salem resident. I was born here. Uh, I grew up here. I went to public school here. And I've lived here darn near most of my life. Uh, I've been quite active in the community, uh, both you know, as, as a child around the dining room table, with my father concerning business, as well as uh, later in life. Uh, I care about Salem deeply. Um, the few years that I've lived away from Salem have been, uh, I lived in Corvallis when I went to Oregon State, and I spent four years living in Louisiana, and the pull of Salem brought me back. So this is where I wanna be. It's where my wife is happy. She's a native of Louisiana, and we are most happy here in Salem. So I, I have a vested interest in our community, and. Uh, how we see it progress. I have three small children, all of which uh, are seven and under, and they are uh, eager, rambunctious, and energetic little people. And I, I want to participate and fill the giant shoes that my family left for me to do the same for them. So that's me in a nutshell. Great. Thank you very much. Dan? I'll have you do your, uh, you're muted right now. If you'll unmute yourself. There we, there we go. My name is Dan Augustine. I grew up in Lake Oswego, Oregon. I attended Lake Oswego High School, um, went to Portland State University, lived prior to this. I lived in North Portland. I currently have a house up there as well, but I went back, came here and bought a house um, while I attended Willamette University for my MBA um, at Atkinson School of, uh, and since then, that was eight years ago, I have fallen in love with the city. I've had some friends that have moved down here and started businesses in the city of Salem. And within those eight years, I've really seen the city progress, um, becoming more livable, more exciting city. And I wanna continue that process. And so I, that's why I'm really excited about being a, a candidate for this position. And I, I look to uh, help the city of Salem continue to grow in a positive fashion, but not too quickly. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you to both of you for applying. Um, why don't we start with you, Councillor Kayser, uh, see if you have a specific question or want to ask one of the general questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll, I'll ask a question from uh, one of our, our question pool we have here that we've asked before. Um, with respect to planning, what do you see as the biggest future challenges facing the city of Salem? And uh, perhaps we'll have um, uh, Dan, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your last name. August, it's Augustine. Augustine, do you yes. wanna start off first? Certainly, yes, Thank you. absolutely. Um, I, I figure like the, the biggest challenge is obviously making Salem more livable. I think the transportation factors that Salem deals with sometimes needs to be worked on. I think, you know, really focusing on alternative forms of transportation and also making you know the more street worthy paths for people to be be able to you know have alternative forms of transportation will really help with the livability of salem i understand the bridges is a big uh situation a big you know issue i don't think that that is the right 
I think really focusing on other alternative modes of transportation and also really focusing on the downtown corridor. I really like the what they're doing with the uh, multi-use spaces that are being developed in the in the downtown corridor now for those people that are working at the state, probably, the, you know, obviously the highest uh, employer in the city of Salem. So making that easier for the city of Salem's employees to really make it easier for them to get to work is something that we should really focus on. Jordan? Uh, sure. Uh, Councillor uh, Kaser, thank you for the question. I would... Uh, you know, Salem is is such a unique little environment. We're, we're not we're not Portland, but we're not Eugene. We're not Ben. We're really our, our own kind of situation. And and to, to dovetail on on what Mr. Augustine said, I think transportation, the downtown core, and all of that is is uh, probably at the top of a lot of people's lists. I think that uh, Salem is an attractive place, and along with that comes a lot of growth. And how we handle that growth in Salem, whether it be housing, multifamily housing, uh, commercial businesses, uh, even industrial. We are a bit of an industrial kind of area that attracts a lot of in industry, whether it's, it's food or production or manufacturing. We really have a lot of facets of, of how to handle growth and progress through planning. Uh, and a lot of that will concern zoning. Um, you know, a lot of the efforts done thus far to accommodate multifamily housing, uh, uh, HB 2001 for uh, multifamily, um, uh, I think up to four plexes on a, on a, on a single, single home plot. Um, trying to accommodate that, um, all of these aspects together is probably going to be the biggest challenge. You know, we, I know we have our comprehensive plan, and I think the comprehensive plan is heading in a, in a good direction. Uh, but trying to accommodate, say, the, the shortfall of commercial land versus the excess of industrial and multifamily versus single family. So I, I think Salem is growing, which is a really good thing, really positive. I'm happy about it. I love Salem, and, and I'm happy that some people have an opinion that they do of Salem. From within, we Salemites can be happy about that and, and uh, <laughs> uh, accommodate growth as necessary for our community. Thank you. Councilor Anderson? I'm going to uh, follow up on Councillor Kayser's question and go off script a little bit. I'm very interested in the concept of growth, and I'm interested in talking about growth uh, for growth's sake versus smart growth for, uh, um, or in conjunction with smart growth, sustainable growth, uh, how we are going to grow in uh, the climate action uh, destruction that is coming our way. And if you could speak if you're familiar with uh, Chuck Moran's work in Strongtown, if you can speak from that perspective or comment on that, um, I'd like to hear what you have to say about the growth and how we manage it. And Jordan, you're first this time. <laughs> well, 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 thank you, Councilor Anderson. I, I appreciate the opportunity to go first this time. Um, growth, growth is a, is a, is a tricky thing. Um, you know, I, it's a common theme these days is how do we grow consciously, safely, and sustainably? And one of our probably most prevalent at the moment sustainable issues is the environment, Salem traffic, uh, CO2, and, and traffic as we know is what is the largest contributor to CO2. You know, we have um, the, the Greenway, we have some bike paths, we have uh, some you know, commercial transit, I, for one, am, am a partaker in bike commuting. I try to use my bike as much as I can. Will admit, I am a bit of a fair weather bike commuter. Uh, if it starts to rain, I get a little bit kind of wheezy about it. Uh, but my commutes are not very far, um, which is fortunate because from the central core of downtown Salem area, most, most stuff is accessible, so commuting is an option. There are points, however, at which you know bike paths run out, traffic lanes expand, and traffic gets congested. So to try to accommodate growth in a sustainable manner means not doing it too, too rapidly, to try to attract developers to bring them in to build big complexes to add to the Salem skyline, but it also means doing so in a conscious manner to accommodate homes for various different groups of people, um, whether it's it's uh, high-rise central housing, well, not high-rise, but uh, you know a, a, a multiple unit facility, to accommodate that, 
or it's it's single family housing or it's industrial and commercial. So I, it's it's kind of a God, it's it's a broad question and I'm giving you a broader answer. I apologize for not choking it down even more, but it, it is it is a hot topic for sure. Any can I elaborate any more? Yes. Sure. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. No, I, that, that's it. I'm just asking if uh, Councilman Anderson has any more questions. No, that's fine. Thank you very much. Dan, go ahead. All right. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. So um, when it comes to Strongtown, uh, I think what you're really talking about is making these small little incremental measures that have, helps the overall livability of the city, uh, really focusing on the small short-term movements like a bike path, developing the culture, those kinds of things, instead of a major project that's going to, you know, use up all of the economic, uh, you know, the all of the money that the, the city has. Um, so I think these small little incremental factors, which develops the city long term, be important for the city of Salem. Uh, that's like the bike path on High Street, you know, through the downtown corridor. That's really the, the small term you know, uh, goal, uh, things that will really make the long-term livability of the city of Salem that much more attractive for people. Uh, you know, I came from, coming from the city of Portland, when I told my friends that I was moving to Salem, they called it so lame. I mean, so that was their nickname for Salem. So it was like, you're moving to so lame, you know? And so now that I've been here for eight years, they've come down and visited me. And they've really seen what the city is all about. And like I said, I have friends that are moving here. I have, they're starting their businesses here. I think just these small little short-term goals is going to help the overall livability and the culture of the city of Salem. Thank you. Let me think. Who's next? Nanki? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and thank you again, both for uh, putting in your applications. I read yes, through and uh, very good, good answers. Um, I'm going to expand. We never follow the rules here in reading <laughs> questions. So um, we, we've spoken a lot about downtown and, and, you know, those folks that may be closer in and, and more the transportation. And that. My question is more specific as to how well do you know the entirety of the city of Salem and, and how frequently might you get to all of the corners or are there what areas are you most familiar with and, and where maybe not so? Because land use decisions will affect them all and we, we see them from all over the community as well. And we'll start with Dan this time. Sounds good. Uh, well, I work in the manufacturing industry. So I work for a Danish tech company that deals with sensors that are used in every manufacturing facility, probably in Jordan's family's manufacturing facility as well, lumber mills. So I'm always out talking to the people so I'm out seeing, you know, those outside lands all of the time. I'm talking to the lumber industry, the man, the food processing industry. Those are those are the people that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so I'm very familiar with those, you know, those industries and those people and and what takes place outside of the downtown quarter of Salem. Okay. Um... So my my familiarity with Salem is 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 really is really good considering uh, a lifelong of living here. I, I grew up in, in South Salem. Uh, I lived in Silverton for about five years while I did custom harvesting, agricultural. So I got to learn very well the Silverton Road, Northeast Salem section of town through not just not just within Salem but beyond the urban growth boundary. Um, I currently live near the downtown area, so I'm, I'm quite familiar with downtown. In fact, my office is located downtown on State Street. Uh, and, and obviously, the waterfront and Front Street area, the greenway that encompasses that, um, you know, all the discussion about the bridge the, or the, the third bridge and where to put it, North Salem, very, very comfortable in that. I, I, I did go to South Salem High School. I graduated from Sprague, so I've, I've kind of gotten a good feel for our or most of the communities in the pockets surrounding Salem and, and what really each kind of community or pocket represents. You know, I, as, a, as a Salemite, you, you learn growing up here, 
certain stigma or reputations from each each sector. And and while that's not what I'm here to discuss or elaborate on, I, I am aware of you know uh, struggles and um, uh, uh, victories for certain areas and where the challenges may be and where there may be additional resources from other communities to provide to other areas. So quite familiar with most of the most all the pockets around town. Excellent, thank you. And that'll be important when uh, you talk about multifamily down the line. Correct. <laughs> and it's I see Councilor Mernicke. Thanks. Councilor Leo. Okay, so it's sort of a, a jump off of uh, Councilor Nankies as a follow up. So you, both of you have discussed several partnerships you've established. So thinking about those relationships, maybe thinking of one or two in particular, how will those relationships inform your process as a planning commissioner? Let's start with you, Jordan. Okay, uh, relationships. Okay, well, <laughs> um, I uh, don't know where to start on that one, but uh, <laughs> the, the, the relationships I've gained ha uh, in Salem, uh, not just from, from growing up here, but in business. Uh, if I go back to my days on Front Street at, at True Brothers and then what became True of Family Foods, a lot of my connections were based in the food industry in the manufacturing and production industry. And those connections and um, uh, those, those relationships evolved into other relationships which involved other aspects. And it seems nine times out of 10, they ended up somehow to do with the city, zoning, planning, uses, uh, the waterfront area, overlay zones, historical districts. Um, those relationships are, for me, are very broad. Uh, they encompass, you know, statewide uh, as well as national. Um, but in dealing with the Salem community, you know, it's, it's it's it for me. It's about dealing with with the people instead of a specific organization or group. Um, whether it's a business contact or it's a contact or group of people that I've gotten to know through business ventures or personally, um, it, it really is a tight knit community. In my in my application, I, I said Salem can be a bit of a, a microcosm, resembling something much bigger than it truly is. But Salem is is is, is plenty big and growing, um, but we still have this small town mentality, or not mentality, but small town type of connection amongst our citizens and residents to where uh, we're all very kind of tightly connected. Thank you. Dan? Yes, so I, obviously the reason why I moved to Salem was because I was going to Willamette University to get my MBA at Atkinson School. And so my community started with Willamette. I developed an amazing bond, uh, friendships with the, the staff, the instructors, the, the people I was in my cohort with, uh, other cohorts. So that's really where I started. And that's really what, the reason why I moved to Salem. So growing that uh, culture, growing those friends, I, I consider them all friends, is one of the reasons why I love Salem so much. Um, I live obviously across the street from Bush Park. I basically have, you know, an amazing block that I live on. My, my, all my neighbors are my friends. Uh, they're very well connected within Salem. Other than, other than that, I, I don't really have any outside sources. I just want to really focus on making Salem the best city it can be really making it the most livable city it can be may, may, uh, helping you know industries survive and thrive making people want to move here, attract people to salem that we want to live in the city of salem that's really my focus and that's really why i applied for this planning position so great thank you councillor osik so uh i guess this one goes to dan first uh, yes just building off of some of the previous questions a little bit is um We've talked about growth and there's some terms like smart growth. And in one of the applications, uh, I, I read about the the, I, the concept of infill versus expanding and, and you both know about the UGB here. So I just wanted to get um, both of your thoughts on the smart growth versus just growing for growth's sake. And Council, I believe that I've kind of touched that on that previously, saying that I think small little incremental decisions 
is really going to benefit the city of Salem more than making a, a large decision for a short-term goal. I think really focusing on the smaller incremental decisions for the long-term growth or livability of Salem is really what Salem needs to focus on. And I think that that's something that I, I, I want to contribute to. Jordan? Uh, thank you, Councilman Ross. I, I think, I think it's, it's Salem needs to balance the small with the big. Um, from, a, from an industry perspective, Salem does have some big industry here. We have the food pr processors, now we have uh, lineage, uh, we have you know all, all of the uh, uh, Amazon, but we also have a lot of, of smaller infill that could take place as well. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't, I, I would stop short of sinking all of our resources into trying to attract uh, more uh, smaller inner city type of um, you know, growth. I, I think that needs to happen in tandem with the revenue generating commercial and industrial. I'm not, I'm not advocating or pushing for industrial. I'm just highlighting what we have, uh, what has been beneficial for jobs and for growth for Salem and what is providing a job and a revenue for so many of our new citizens or residents, excuse me. Um, so I think, I think there needs to be a balance of infill from within the city interior, especially within the downtown core. You know, the four years that I spent away from downtown or away from Salem to when I moved back, the, the growth uh, and development was incredible. Um, my biggest complaint in college was there's no place to go out in Salem. But when I came back after being gone for four years, Salem had turned into a new thriving kind of place. And it, it, it's hard to see that immediately on the surface. But if we step back and take a look after an extended period, can see that that growth is happening. We know what's happening in industrial, but I think we also need to focus on the internal stuff as well. Sir Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you both for applying for this position. I hope that uh, you know that we can only appoint one of you and I hope whoever is the unsuccessful candidate will consider applying in the future. Uh, participation in the Planning Commission and all of our other boards and commissions is really critical to the work that we do. And, and uh, we appreciate having strong candidates for these positions, so thank you. Uh, my question is, we recently uh, eliminated parking requirements for multifamily housing developments within a quarter mile of, of transit corridors. And I'm wondering, uh, and basically we let the market uh, drive that, uh, the parking as opposed to our rules. And I'm wondering what you think about that. Dan, okay. I think uh, you're first. Honey, okay. yeah. Certainly. Um, so multi, can you explain that a little bit more? I'm sorry, Mr. Commissioner. So, sure. We have, certain, we have certain transit corridors within, this, within uh, the city where the chariots basically have committed to always have 15 minute service. You know, it's, it's the major streets, it's Lancaster, Absolutely. it's uh, Market, it's uh, Commercial, Liberty, those, you know, those areas. Um, and basically what we did is we said new multifamily development uh, no longer has a minimum parking space requirement. In other words, we used to mandate, you have to have so many uh, parking spaces per unit, okay? Gotcha. And now we've said, okay, you don't have to have any if you don't want it, as we're gonna let the market decide. So sure. recently in a, uh, we, we have a development downtown that has uh, very little parking uh, coming, coming in, you know? And so the question, my question to you is, what do you think of that decision? It's kind of a controversial one. Some people are really happy with it. Some people are not so happy with it, and I'm wondering what your opinion is. I, I certainly believe in alternatives, alternative transportation, um, you know, coming from Portland, coming from other areas. I, I certainly believe, I used to ride TriMet bus all the time in Portland to and from Portland State to where I lived. I certainly believe in alternative transportation. So I feel that to help, you know, this goes even into the, you know, the reason for a third bridge or whatever. So basically, I fully believe that alternative modes of transportation is what Salem needs to focus on. I, I've noticed that in other smaller communities uh, like Corvallis or other communities where alternative modes of transportation, bikes, buses, public transportation really works and really helps the city and helps the overall city, the growth of the city and make it makes it move smoother in the long term. So I, I fully believe that that's a good decision. Thank you. Yes. 
Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Hoy. Um, you know, my, my my viewpoint on the on the parking requirement, uh, I guess, is multifaceted. But on on the alleviation of parking requirements for for so many communities along these main thoroughfares, parking can be such a hassle. And if we're trying to meet the um, you know the requirements of growth of Salem, and trying to accommodate multifamily housing where maybe a single family house may have stood. Parking becomes an issue, um, and while while commercial real estate is not my lifelong career, I also see that in my short career in real estate affecting how property is bought and sold along the main corridors of Liberty and Commercial in downtown areas. People are a little less inclined to go down there because there's less parking, and if that means for families of small developments who who have to the, for the developer to maintain a certain number of available parking spaces. This really opens the door for them to be able to uh, accommodate those housing needs. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm cautious to try to force upon people uh, maybe some of the standards that we may see uh, in the Portland area. While I, I think it's really valuable and it works for them, it works very well. Salem is, is kind of a unique little situation where so many people are so dependent upon their cars and we've all just stuffed the roads and there's traffic and there's issues and there's problems. You know, my rule of thumb is it takes 20 minutes to get anywhere in Salem no matter what, um, which at times has proven true. So I think to alleviate some of these parking issues may assist people in making that transition into finding alternative modes of transportation, whether it's chariots, uh, foot, uh, bike paths, which I'm a big fan of the bike paths. Uh, I think those are a valuable resource for our community. So if it helps kind of push people into that direction, maybe not a push, but maybe just kind of a nudge. I think that's that's beneficial to the housing, the developers, and to our traffic problems. Thank you. Councillor Nordyke. You're gonna, uh, there you go. Yeah, it, the space bar wasn't working. Hi, and good afternoon to both of you gentlemen. Thank you so much. And you both are obviously well-qualified candidates for the position, so I appreciate very much your time and your interest. Um, to what extent should planning commission decisions take into consideration two things, the impact on climate action and the impact on marginalized communities in our area, many of whom are not engaged in the development process? Well, I suppose it'd be my turn to go first. Uh, thank you, Councilor Nordyke, for the question. I believe that climate is something that should influence all of our decisions at, at every level. And well, I, I believe it's easy to place the burden upon doing what's environmentally friendly upon a developer. I think that that process goes all the way back to the very beginning, to the application, to the first people reviewing it, to the planning commission, to the council, and it and it has to meet these these stop gates, these these check gates, if you will, to ensure that not just the developer, but that the end use and and, and I'm 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 cautious to use the term developer as though they're a big bad you know entity because a lot of our uh, fellow residents in Salem are developers from teeny tiny all the way up to to big so. Um, to punish them or not punish them, but to put the burden upon them entirely, I think is is probably not in our best interest. I think it's our responsibility, uh, the planning commission's responsibility, the council's responsibility to evaluate this from the beginning. Um, in terms of uh, the marginal communities, I'm, you know, I I I kind of have a, a soft spot in my heart because for these communities. Uh, our family business would not really have been able to survive. We were very, very uh, dependent upon a lot of very hardworking people. And what I became very familiar with uh, in my days managing our operations on Front Street was the difficulty in communicating. And it's not just a, a language barrier. It's a, it's a communication barrier that goes back to how do you get a hold of them? Are they having a, a family struggle? Is email the best way to get a hold of them? Well, does the email go to their mom's email, not their email? Do you have to deal? How many layers of this onion do you have to get through to make contact to some of these communities? Um, it, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a moving target. The best way to to maintain 
connection with them, the best way to keep them engaged is an ongoing effort. It, it seems like it, it never stops. It's an active process. It's a collaborative process. It's churches, community leaders, organizations, trying to keep all of that on the table um, to keep them engaged and ourselves engaged. Because if we can't ever not be engaged on these issues, these are incredibly important. They're a huge percentage of our community. They're the backbone of our work environment. And um, yeah, we, we uh, for, for climate and the marginal communities, we really have to make an effort on all of it. Yeah. Obviously climate uh, is a major topic going on right now, um, especially, you know, and I fully believe that we need to focus on the climate as a community and, and really, well, obviously you see what's happening, you know, throughout the state of Oregon, um, Climate is a is a major topic for our young our younger uh, generations, and so we really need to think about them and also the marginalized people to focus on them and and help them long term. I really think that uh, the the Climate Change Act is is a major thing that that us Salem people could be spearheading and and focus on as a community for the state of Oregon, considering. You know, we are the, you know, the centralized, uh, the state is here, so the capital is here. So I think as, a, as the city of Salem, we could really be focusing and spearheading the actions to help the whole state of Oregon. Great. Climate Thank Act. you. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Lewis. You know, uh, for the sake of time, I'll pass. Okay, great. <laughs> Appreciate that. Never well, we yet. are done with our interviews, did anyone have a question pop up that they have a burning desire to have uh, answered? Gentlemen, thank you very much. You were very responsive. It's very interesting to hear your thoughts. Uh, we'll be voting on this as uh, our first order of business and we'll be doing a public vote so you can take names. How this <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you again. Thank very you so much. much. Thank, thank you, you very much. Members of the council, thank, thank, you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. I'll now send you all over to the other meeting, okay? Okay. Are we ready to begin then? Yes, so. Uh, welcome to uh, the city council meeting for July 13th, uh, and I'll call the meeting to order. We've just completed a work session uh, interviewing planning commission, potential planning commission members. Our, one of our first orders of business will be to vote on that. Uh, so, Call to order and let's do a roll call. Just see who stayed with us. Councilor Kayser. Present. Councilor Anderson. I'm still here. <laughs> Councilor Nanke. Here. Councilor Leung. Here. Councilor Osik. Here. Councilor Hoy. Here. Councilor Nordyke. Present. Councilor Lewis. Here with full battery. And great. And Mayor Bennett. Here, thank you. And will you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, and with liberty and justice for all. Okay, our first order of business is the, oh, let me just take a look here. Just so I understand where we are. Yeah, we'll vote on the planning commission uh, applicants. We had uh, Jordan Truitt and Dan Augustine. Uh, we had an opportunity to conduct a, a reasonably thorough, about as thorough as you can be in a half an hour of uh, asking questions. So the way this will be done is it'll be done by voice vote in a roll call. 
Okay, so when your name is called, please state the name of the candidate that you are voting for. Councillor Kayser. Augustine. Councillor Anderson. Augustine. Councillor Nanke. Jordan Truitt. Councillor Leung. Augustine. Councillor Osik. Augustine. Councillor Hoy. Augustine. Councillor Nordyke. Augustine. Councillor Lewis. Truitt. Mayor Bennett. Truitt. So we have uh, six votes for Dan Augustine, and he has been appointed the Planning Commission for a partial term expiring December 31st, 2020. Very good. Congratulations, Mr. Augustine. And, uh, look forward to having you on our Planning Commission. We will move on here. Councillor Hoy, any additions or deletions to the agenda? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I move additions and deletions to the agenda. Second. That Second by Anderson. Those consist of item 3.2B, correction to the fiscal year 2021 City of Salem bu budget resolution, and item 6E, which is an appeal of the site plan review decision for Grant Elementary School. Uh, it's. That's the bottom line. It's an appeal of the site plan review uh, decision for Grant Elementary School. Okay, very good. Any discussion? All those in, whoop, we'll do a roll call. Councillor Kayser. Aye. Councillor Anderson. Aye. Councillor Nanke. Aye. Councillor Leung. Aye. Councillor Osik. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Lewis? Aye. Mayor Bennett? Aye. Okay, motion passes. Uh, Council comments? Councillor Anderson? Sorry, I had to move my cursor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have two uh, items of comments, uh, both of which are uh, unfortunate and sad in their own way. The first one is, um, I just want to announce that Catherine Reed, a longtime uh, citizen of Salem and has been very active along with her husband Wally in various historic preservation issues and especially uh, issues of preservation of Bush's Pasture Park. They live on Lower LaFell right opposite the park and both Kathy and Wally were very, very instrumental in getting rid of the invasive species in the park and bringing back the natural species uh, like uh, some as wild as you can get rhododendrons on the slope from upper park to the lower park and also um, uh, uh, the uh, camasoil field. So I am uh, uh, sorry to announce that Kathy has passed and I wish the best to Wally and the rest of her family. And I wanna thank her um, for all the service she has um, performed very ably for the city. And Mr. Mayor, I'm discovering my battery is, battery is running low, so I'm gonna go off and fix it. And then I'll, I'll do my second half after some other counselors talk. All righty, Councillor Nordyke, did you have your hand up? I did, thank you. A couple quick points. First of all, I recently toured the Wallace Marine uh, camping area for homeless individuals. As many know, we have two designated camping zones for persons experiencing homelessness in addition to our car camping program and other forms of shelter. I toured one of those sections at Cascade Gateway Park a while ago, and I recently toured a section of homeless camping at Wallace Marine Park. Um, it's fascinating in that, you know, once you drive by the West Salem Roths, the courthouse gym, the pristine park grounds, the softball fields, once you start walking on a trail, it's a whole other world. And if anyone is interested in doing volunteer work to help neighbors in need, I think there is a huge need right now. 
There was an article in the Statesman Journal that I highly recommend that everyone read out there. It had a lot of great and disturbing and alarming information from a lot of our community partners in homelessness. We know evictions are on the rise. We know that persons experiencing food insecurity and housing insecurity is on the rise and domestic violence on the rise, all because of COVID-19 and its financial impacts. So I strongly encourage folks to get to know your community partners, whether it's the Food Share, whether it's Arches, whether it's um, you know Center for Hope and Safety. There are a lot of community partners out there who are doing phenomenal work in tandem with our city staff. Our city staff continue to work really hard on these issues. Um, the homeless campers that I talk to Depending on who you ask, I heard numbers range from there being 100 to up to 300 people all living in that same area. I talked to a number of the women campers who were there as well as men. There are safety concerns, as you can imagine. They have no, uh, they have no facilities out there whatsoever. So any water must be brought in. There's no electricity, of course. And um, there's just a long dirt path that goes deeper and deeper into the woods which to me raises the question, if these campgrounds are still permitted when the rainy season begins, a simple truckload of gravel would help preserve that path from turning into a mud pit. There are a lot of folks who commute on bicycles. There are folks with physical disabilities and mobile impairments that will make it difficult when that dirt path, which is hard packed and dry right now, but we all know there's a rainy season coming. So I think just a simple load of gravel might make a, a big difference in addition to plenty of other things that we have on the way. Uh, another thing related to that point, um, months ago when I toured Cascade Gateway Park, I noted the fact that the area was actually, what I saw was very clean, having toured it with a, a Dave from Church of the Park. And he mentioned the Cash for Trash program. I mentioned that with council as well. And I actually called up Walmart and uh, said, hey, you know, as I understand it, people turn in a bright yellow bag of garbage for a $10 gift card to Walmart. Sure would be nice. If you guys would consider making a little donation, maybe. Could be a win-win for us in the community and for Walmart. And uh, the Walmart rep I talked to said she would take it back to her people. And I heard radio silence for about a couple of months. And then recently in June, they said that they would be sending us something. And so Gretchen, Ben, and I have been keeping tabs on it. I've yet to actually see this money materialize, but I want to continue encouraging Walmart to make a donation because cleanliness is absolutely essential in these campgrounds and having the support that they need just to help clear out garbage. Again, these are basic needs these are quality of life, basic issues that we can make a small contribution towards. So I just wanted to let folks know that I've been looking into those things. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Okay, anyone else? Okay, Councilor Anderson, go ahead, your second point. Yeah, thank you Ms. very much. It turns out I had unplugged my machine to turn on a fan this afternoon and now I need the machine more and I need the fan. Machine. You have an electrician's license. What's the deal? <laughs> yeah. Um, the second issue is sort of dovetails onto what Councillor uh, Nordyk was talking about, and that is the COVID-19 crisis. I've talked about this before in the past, and it's clear that Oregon is traveling in the wrong direction, albeit while Marion County's doing pretty good. But uh, we have had a, a succession of days over the last week when we have more and more and more uh, uh, confirmed cases of COVID-19 by testing. And all predictions are it's going to get worse, worse, worse before it gets better, which is why the governor has instituted uh, 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 reinstated the mask ban. And it's pretty easy. I did this last time. Here's my mask. It's on, and uh, and I will say it is a little of a fashion statement, but um, you know it's easy to do, and it's not an issue of your personal freedom to not wear a mask. It's an issue of being a member of the community, contributing to the whole community, and your personal freedom stops when you can potentially interfere with the well-being of somebody else in the community. So I urge everybody to wear masks. 
every time they're out in the public and uh, I, I work when I'm out, uh, I have it when I'm out working in my yard because people pass by and I, I, I put them on. So just please be aware of this. It's going to get worse and we need to do everything we can to uh, tamp it down as much as we can. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Nanke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And just to, to carry over from uh, Councillor Anderson's first point, the uh, the reeds were instrumental in a lot of things, and and what a great asset to our community. Um, for those of you who may not know, I know the mayor was on the council at the time, but uh, they used to come down and testify every year. They were the owners or uh, residents on the last gravel street in the city of Salem. And, uh, through much work, we finally got that paved. And so I, I'm, I'm so sad to, to hear of, of Mrs. Reed's passing, but uh, and I wish their family um, and, and friends peace and, and that the, the Lord looks after them, so. Thank you, Counselor. I think we all have incredible memories of the Reeds and, and uh, the tremendous work they've done for this community. Anyone else, Counselor Kayser? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I wanted to actually invite uh, Kristen Rutherford, uh, Urban Development Director, to come speak about uh, the downtown streets on the weekends. And um, Kristen, if you could just provide perhaps a update for council since we, we passed that um, about a month ago, I guess it was or so. Um, but how, I'm just curious how it's going and, and um, yeah, if we can just talk about that. Yeah. So this was motion was passed on June 8th at the council meeting. Um, we first implemented this with a trial project for about a week long duration with a half street closure on State Street from Commercial to Liberty Street. This was on the south side of the street in front of the bank, um, Cooks, Wild Pear and Taproot and that allowed Wild Pear and Taproot to expand out into the street during that week long closure. And we received um, a lot of mixed feedback around that, uh, some from businesses wanting to have, um, also have the opportunities to expand and wanting to have the full street closures. So we pivoted after that trial period to start implementing weekend closures. And the first one we did um, began on July 3rd for the holiday weekend. And we did full street closures in six different locations downtown. And we got, again, a, quite a bit of mixed feedback. There were a lot of folks in the community that really liked the closures. Um, there were businesses that took advantage of it and it really helped out their sales, some of the restaurant businesses. But we also received feedback from other businesses that it made access to their business very difficult, especially retailers that have um, customers that might drop things off or pick things up, um, like books or, um, furniture, that sort of thing. And so, so we continued this for one more weekend and to see how that goes and to get a little bit more feedback. And the feedback continues from the business community to be pretty evenly split between those that like the closures and that are benefiting from the closures and those that are not benefiting from the closures. So as we look at where we go from here, some of the challenges that we have in trying to customize this in different locations um, have to do with vehicle safety and pedestrian safety and the traffic management plans in these areas. So while businesses would really like to see, can we close on weekends a half block from an alley to a street, um, but keep the other half open, or do weekend half street closures on the north side or the south side of the street, um, those sorts of customizations are all very difficult to do week by week and with and, and preserve traffic safety. So um, we can really only meet those safety guidelines on full block closures, not half block from alley to the street um, because of the concern that vehicles coming down the road could continue driving through barricades um, and run into people that are dining. Um, we, we could move forward with half street 
closures on a permanent basis through September. So in certain locations where we could close off one side of the road or another side of the road in a different location, um, as long as it could work with the traffic flow. So we'd like to explore that some more. And then another thing that we would like to explore with businesses is um, not closing streets, but closing down parking spaces. So the motion that was presented spoke specifically to street closures. Um, so I just, before we started moving down the path of parking space closures and not street closures, just wanted to get some additional council direction on that because that we could customize more easily for the businesses. Thank you. Councilor Kayser. Yeah, I was just gonna, thank you. I was gonna say, um, you know, I've been part of the conversations for the street closers um, with a, uh, a committee, I don't know, a group, <laughs> including uh, myself, urban development staff, um, Main Street Association, the chamber and downtown businesses to kind of do a recap after each weekend. Um, and I think that, you know, as the, the, the motion um, giver, the person who made the motion, but Thank the her. council, I mean, I would think that there's flexibility within that to to modify things as we as we discover challenges. I mean, <laughs> which we're going to discover, and and I don't know either how the governor's uh, mandate that just came out today about limiting indoor gatherings to ten people and requiring masks outside. I don't know how that's going to affect this. So I feel that the council. I mean, I feel like we've already given flexibility to staff, but just to reiterate that, um, I, I would say, yeah, please, you know, change change as needed and and be adaptable to that. Do uh, councilor, one of the questions I've had is whether we have empowered the staff enough to actually act on their own to begin to adapt to some of the problems we're we're running into down there. I've had uh, several uh, retailers contact me. Uh, very concerned about the impact it's having on their business, while at the same time, others, particularly in the restaurant business, feeling somewhat comfortable. I went downtown Saturday evening, I happened to be down there for another event at the dinner hour, and there was no use of the Court Street uh, portion I was looking at between High and Liberty. There was just nobody in the street, walking, sitting, few people on a, on a sidewalk. So. I came away wondering, is this being used as we thought it would? Is there a, is there a need or would the parking islands serve the numbers that are really actually taking advantage of this kind of, of opportunity? I, would they have the freedom under what you're saying to kind of begin to adapt this? Is that what you're thinking? I, I would say so, yes. Um, uh, or that would be my, if I had to go back to my state of mind, yes, the intent is to let's try it and then adjust yeah. if needed. And I think that there are going to be areas of downtown where full street closure makes sense because you have businesses taking advantage of that and they're using it and it's working. Um, and then other parts, uh, blocks that don't, it doesn't make sense perhaps for their business model or or they're close yeah. though, or, I mean, any number of reasons. So I think, you know, the overall point here is to make it so our downtown businesses can survive. I mean, right. truly into like a year from now and, and what can we do? And I know there's been a lot of conversation about equity and I know there's some businesses downtown that don't feel that this is an equitable thing. I guess I would argue that the businesses right now are not under the same um, guidelines either though. It's not equitable. It's a mandated inequity right now from the governor. So restaurants have different rules than retail does right now. So, I mean, there's there's some things, but I think we need to be flexible to adjust. I, I, I personally feel like staff can be given that leeway to make decisions and to change and to, you know. Is that enough, Kristen? Is that enough? information for you or do you need something more formal what do you need no i that's sufficient although i see councillor nanke was raising his yeah. hand and wanted to make sure he didn't have the comment about that I, sure and, well when councillor kayser first made that motion and we were trying to pick different streets i i commented that we should let staff kind of pick those and move and i thought that's kind of where we ended up that um staff would kind of see how it worked or not in certain areas and and if if staff doesn't feel they have um the ability to to 
modify those based on positive or negative implications, I, I, I think we should give it to them. Ultimately, we'll, we'll be hammered. And so I, I think they, yeah. <laughs> do, uh, you know, yeah. a, a great job at making sure that uh, the interests on, on any side are, are, are being served to the, the best extent that we can. So Kristen, do you feel like you have the latitude to make some decisions? Yes, I do, because the question that I had um, was really tied to the motion um, directing for street closures. And so this giving us the flexibility to just work with some parking space, clo parking space closures is um, what I was hoping to get. Councilor Anderson, did you want to speak? No, I, everybody said what I need to speak. So for once, I'll remain as silent as possible. Okay. Is, is everybody okay with the direction? I mean, was is anyone real concerned that we're headed? Everybody's okay? Okay. Good. As long as you understand the sense of the council was that you were given broad latitude and the mistakes that were made are yours and now we can fix them. <laughs> <laughs> I've got it. <laughs> Just kidding, Chris. Okay. We will move on then. Any more uh, comment, public comment? Or, yeah, oh, yeah, Mr. Manager, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councilors, I would like to take a few minutes to, to talk about the questions that are still occurring regarding actions taken by the city and the police department during demonstrations and protests in late May and early June. The impacts of those actions must be considered. Chief Moore's report is one step in the work necessary to answer the question or the impacts consistent with city council's values of Salem being a safe, welcoming and livable community. There are more steps the city will be taking to ensure policies, procedures and practices are aligned with city council and community expectations. Through the work sessions that council has already talked about, you will begin reviewing and discussing information on police operations and programs, including the school resource officers and the department's response and resources for non-criminal behaviors such as mental health crisis and homelessness. This learning is critical to having a police department that serves and protects the community according to city council priorities. City council's interest in a performance audit of the police department is a positive action. On tonight's agenda is the staff report requested by city council. The staff report recommends areas of emphasis for a performance audit an outside review, looking at data, asking questions will provide the department, the next police chief, the city manager, city council, and the community objective information on what is working well in Salem and what needs improvement. While the performance audit is underway and there may be some overlap with the performance audit, specific areas of review by city staff will be use of force policies, procedures, and training, police presence at demonstrations, street closure requirements, curfew notification and implementation, capability of department of the department to identify violent behavior during demonstrations, costs and benefits of technology such as body cameras, public notification of crowd control methods. Results of these reviews will be shared with city council. Last year, Chief Moore announced his retirement. Thankfully, he agreed to continue serving this year the recruitment for Salem's next police chief is starting. Community members have provided input on expectations for the next chief. The selection process will provide additional opportunities for input and dialogue. We are all aware of the violence around the country that can occur during demonstrations and protests. The city and the police department must have tools to be able to uphold freedom of speech while also preserving public safety. This is the conversation before all of us, everyone in our community. I look forward to continuing and amplifying the essential conversations on policing so Salem continues to be the city of peace. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Councilor Anderson. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, City Manager. Um, I think this is a fantastic step, and I have to say that um, I and some other councilors had some concerns about the scope of the uh, first police response. And I think that we're looking at two different areas here. One is the how the police department dealt with the protesters 
And the other, uh, by that, I mean the people who were protesting uh, on Black Lives Matter and how they dealt with them. And then the other half is how the police department uh, dealt with the people downtown who were openly carrying guns. And so I think that uh, uh, an audit from outside and this discussion would be a very good thing. And we can really get the information we need um, you know, to um, both support our citizens and support our excellent police department. So I, I look forward to a further explanation through the audit and through other um, uh, colloquy among council and the police and the city manager to make sure that uh, lessons have been learned from the, uh, the last uh, go around and uh, any changes, appropriate changes will be made. So thank you, city manager, and uh, I look forward to moving forward on this. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Mr. Manager. Very good. Really appreciate uh, the, the work you and the chief uh, have are, are taking us down. I think you've had a, a real challenging several weeks, and, and this, I think, is the kind of review that will be valuable to all of us uh, to have this, this work done. So thank you. Okay. That is it. Have no proclamations, no presentations. I have one person for public comment, uh, Jonathan Jones. Oh. Here there I'm... he is. Can you hear me? Sure can. How are you, Jonathan? I'm well, thank you. Good. I'm enjoying uh, my book. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good. I am. Thank you. Yeah, uh, that, the library is going well. Uh, we're, we're having a lot, of, a lot of people check out books. Um, Excellent. And it is uh, along those the lines of, of education that um, sort of led me to uh, reach out and, and Counselor Hoy, um, you know, was receptive to the reaching out about the naming of Center Street to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard Drive Avenue, wh whichever way we want to go. Um, the desire uh, was to aid in passive education about um, civil rights history, about racial history, Oregon and Oregon as a whole and Salem uh, specifically are, are fairly uh, behind in terms of public knowledge of, of these things. And, you know, we're, we are one of only uh, 16, 14 states that do not have um, one of their main uh, thoroughfares named after Martin Luther King. Um, it, I feel like it would be a very nice thing to bring that in line with the majority of the country and, and show solidarity there, uh, show recognition there for the struggle and, and that continues to this day and, and for uh, a man who gave his life for, for a better world for all of us. Uh, from a personal standpoint, when I when I moved here and I started, you know, integrating myself into the community, um, it became very, very clear that there were not a lot of people that looked like me, and there was also not a lot of representation of people that looked like me. And this this move to rename a street uh, is the first of a million steps that need to be taken in order to uh, unify us and, and have us all have a, a better and a more equitable existence in our city. Um, I think that Center Street is a wonderful street for it because it, it removes all of the, the possibility of the street being abandoned, uh, which has happened in other cities. Um, street gets renamed. And very quickly, there's there's some redlining and some flight that happens from that area. And by using Center Street, you kind of automatically avoid that. You, you can't really avoid that piece of town. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, about the future and 20 years from now, someone who grew up in Salem, who looks like me or looks like you and had to travel on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard every day and how that could impact their life and how that could make them 
think a little bit deeper about things. Um, the, the power of passive education, I think, is really strong. And so that's, that's where I'm at. Um, ed education is, is, it's not my field, but it is my passion. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's all I have to say about it. Thank you very much for the time. Well, thank you for sharing that. It was really a helpful perspective, uh, Councillor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Jones, for coming down. I really, really appreciate uh, your words tonight, and I very much appreciate your suggestion to me that we take this action. And And I realize, like you said, it's a symbolic, it's a symbolic step, but it's a really important symbolic step, and it's, it's the first step of many. And you sparked this idea, and I want to make sure everybody realizes that, that this was not my idea. I'm just the person who happens to be sitting in this seat that can maybe bring it forward and make it happen. And you were you were the person who, who gave me that idea. And I really am grateful because it is so important. And, uh, you know, tonight, all we're going to be doing is hopefully directing staff to come back uh, later with, with an ordinance where we'll actually be able to really discuss the merits and, and all of the issues and have a big a public process. But this is the first and most important step because it's what gets the ball rolling. And and your words, I think, are very inspirational and critical in this conversation, and I really appreciate them. Thank you. Anyone? Yes, Councilor Nagy. Did you have your thumb up or hand up? No, that was just a thumb up. Okay. Yes, Mr. Jones for uh, the suggestion. Yep. Anyone else? All right. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Really appreciate it. And again, you're in Ward 1 at the Epilogue Restaurant. Is that correct? I want to make sure we got that right. <laughs> great. Epilogue Thank you. Kitchen. It's a great restaurant. Epilogue Kitchen. Very good. That's the only public comment we have this evening. So we'll move on to the consent calendar. Councilor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move approval of the consent calendar. Did we have a poll? Oh, with the fall. I'm sorry. Yes. With the fall. It's yours. Poll. <laughs> and it's mine. <laughs> I am 3.3D. Very good. David. Second. Second by Austin. Thank, thank you. The consent calendar consists of item 3.1A, the June 22nd, 2020 draft city council minutes. Item 3.2A, in it, which initiates the adoption process for historic preservation plan update and historic code amendments. Item 3.2B, which is a correction to the fiscal year 2021 city of Salem budget resolution. Item 3.3A, collective bargaining agreement with the city, the Salem City Attorney's Collective Bargaining Unit. Item 3.3B, uh, is a position on League of Oregon Cities legislative priorities for 2021 Oregon legislative session. Item 3.3C, a policy statement for interim and 2021 Oregon legislative session. 3.3D has been pulled, and that concludes the consent agenda. Any discussion? All those in favor will be asked. Councillor Anderson. Aye. Councillor Nanke. Aye. Councillor Leung. Aye. Councillor Osik. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Lewis. Aye. Councillor Kayser. Aye. And Mayor Bennett. Aye. Motion passes. Okay, we'll go then to our public hearing. I'm going to open the public hearing on appeal of system development charge expenditures, item 20-227. If I could turn that over to the recorder or whomever is gonna launch us on this one. Thank you, Mayor. The City Council will now hold a public hearing for the purpose of hearing an appeal regarding the use of stormwater system development charge SDC funds for the purchase of real property at 298 Tabin Road Northwest. This public hearing will be conducted pursuant to Council Rule 16 and the following timeline at Time limits will apply. Staff presentation is limited to 15 minutes. The appellant is limited to 15 minutes. Other interested persons are limited to three minutes per person. And uh, let's see, there's rebuttal by the applicant, uh, excuse me, by the appellant is seven minutes. And it will begin with a staff uh, presentation. All right, Glenn, are you the staff? I am the staff. I'm gonna need some help from IT because my share screen is not working. I hope somebody can help me with that. Oh boy, they run someone over. Where at your house? 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, this was supposed to work. It's not working. So is there somebody who can help with the, I have a PowerPoint presentation that I, I guess I can skip if, if it takes too long here. Glenn, is it on one of the share drives or on your, on your local workstation? It's on my local. All right. Uh, stand by. It's not letting me share the screen. We'd have to give you a call and walk you through. I don't know if you want to wait for that. We'll take a five minute break. Great. Okay. Thank you.
we do not want to miss a PowerPoint when given the opportunity. So <laughs> take us down the road here. Okay, uh, well, good evening, uh, Mayor Ben and Councilors. My name is Glenn Davis. I am the Chief Development Engineer in the Public Works Department. Um, and I have this, a brief presentation to, uh, regarding tonight's public hearing for the appeal of the purchase of real property at uh, 298 Raven Taven Road. On the, on the right side of the screen, you can see that the property in question is between Wallace Road on the west and Wallace Marine Park on the east and then Glen Creek Road on the south. So for background, the city discovered in 2017 that the Taven property was available for purchase. Staff recommended this uh, purchase was a good opportunity for several reasons. There are potential park benefits because it is adjacent to Wallace Marine Park. There are potential stormwater benefits because it is adjacent to a tributary of Glen Creek and it's also in the Willamette River floodplain. And then there's also potential transportation benefits because it's in the alignment of Marine Drive. So the most immediate benefit from the purchase was toward the city's stormwater system. So based on the staff recommendation, council approved the purchase uh, in 2019 for uh, use of stormwater STCs to make that purchase. So in May of this year, EM Easterly submitted an appeal asserting that this purchase of the Haven property is not eligible for stormwater STC expenditures. So the applicable re regulations subject to this appeal come from the Oregon Revised Statutes, or ORS 223.307. That requires that the STC expenditures be included in what's called an eligible project list. So Salem's project list, which is also called 309 list, was created pursuant to that section ORS 223.309 uh, when our original stormwater methodology was completed uh, about 20 years ago. And the appellant asserts that the Taven purchase was not included on that list and therefore is not eligible for expenditure. So staff analyzed the assertions made by the applicant and the applicant is correct that uh, their acquisition of the Taven property is not included as an individual project on that 309 list. However, the stormwater master plan and the stormwater SDC methodology are the source for the 309 list. And they specify that that list includes 5% allowance for small projects. So the total, total eligible project costs on the 309 list back in, 2000, in year 2000 was just over $200 million. So that 5% allowance means that there's over $10 million based on $2,000, uh, year $2,000, for those small unexpected projects like this Taven acquisition. So the purchase price was approximately $400,000, which is well within the 5% allowance. And um, one other thing to add is that the appellant asserts that there's a 5% allowance is restricted by a fixed ratio within each basin, that you're only allowed to use 5% within each basin. Um, but the, mes the master plan and the methodology and no other SDC methodology has that kind of limitation. It is a citywide um, system. So with that, uh, we recommend that the expenditure complies with the provisions ORS 223.307, and we recommend that uh, council deny the appeal. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Okay, we will move on then. Uh to the um, appellant. Just a minute, I'm trying to get my screen large enough I can see EM. There he is. Mr. Easterly, would you like to introduce yourself and take us through your argument? Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Bennett, members of the council. I am EM Easterly. Ward 8, thank you for addressing my appeal. And I appreciate Mr. Davis's quick summary of his department's perception of the problem. I am asking for the city council to review the manner in which staff formulated the November 25, 2019 recommendation to purchase real property at 298 Cabin Road Northwest. 
I'm asking council to evaluate whether that recommendation was an abuse of staff discretion, which led to a procedurally inappropriate and perhaps illegal use of system development charge funds. Procedurally, this appeal, appeal focuses upon the city's failure to follow its own 2000 Salem Stormwater Master Plan policies. Legally, the appeal focuses on the city's failure to follow state statutes. As a remedy, I ask that the city return all stormwater SDC funds expended and identify a more appropriate revenue source to fund this claim, quote, natural environment stewardship, unquote, land purchase along the edge of Wallace Marine Park. The defendants in this appeal are those city staff members who disregarded their responsibilities to council and inappropriately recommended the use of stormwater SDC funds to purchase the Taven property. The relationship between staff and council must be one of trust. Council relies upon accurate and legally correct information from staff. The staff recommendation which council adopted last November to purchase a parcel of land in West Salem was an inappropriate application of staff's discretionary responsibility. Staff recommended using stormwater SDC funds to purchase the property. That recommendation met neither the legal requirements of ORS 223.07, which is contrary to what Mr. Davis just said, nor the policy requirements of the Salem Stormwater Master Plan. As I detailed in my document for, and I do hope you have that before you, written testimony, the stormwater master plan identifies no stormwater project along the Wallace Marine Park in the West Bank stormwater basin and just grants 200,000 for small conveyance projects. This query began last winter. I sought to identify a dwelling in the vicinity of Ross for a family facing possible eviction. I learned early in February that the city had purchased a home at 298 Taven Road Northwest. In mid-March, staff directed me to the November 2019 council minutes where I learned A, the dwelling was to be removed, B, stormwater detention, and a potential future transportation right away were the reasons for the purchase, and C, the purchase was funded by stormwater system development charges. The November staff report did not describe a stormwater detention facility. So I turned to the stormwater master plan to identify just what stormwater detention facility was included in the plan. As Mr. Davis noted, I found none. Staff subsequently explained that the purchased funds came from the stormwater master plan, 5% pipe and ditch inter, excuse me, infrastructure improvement allocation. That claim did not withstand the analysis and careful scrutiny described in my December, excuse me, document number four. Staff also recommended using stormwater SDC funds to remove a dwelling from the property. That there is nothing in the stormwater master plan which justifies using stormwater SDC funds to remove a dwelling, which is the demolition of capital, not a capital infrastructure improvement. By law, stormwater SDC funds must be used for stormwater infrastructure improvements. The November staff report recommended the land purchase claiming the purchase supported, quote, reliable and efficient infrastructure, unquote, without describing that, that stormwater infrastructure. 
Mr. Davis suggested that there might be such as that in his comments this evening. Over the last four months, the city bureaucracy has sought to offer explanations which justify the November 2019 purchase recommendation while avoiding many of my direct questions and thus avoiding the legally questionable disclosure of the reasons for the purchase. I have submitted a list of questions for council to review. It is at Appendix B of the document equal to this oral presentation. That's called document seven if you need to look it up. In essence, the answers I have received to these and other questions fail to affirm that November approval A conforms with the requirements of ORS 294.358, B meets the policies of the Salem Stormwater Master Plan, or C complies with the obligations of ORS 223.307. Staff's November recommendations were an abuse of discretion because those recommendations did not comply with state statutes or follow city council adopted stormwater master plan policies, nor have the subsequent documents or belief declarations offered by staff provided substantial evidence that the November recommendation complied with state statutes and Salem stormwater master plan obligations. In summary, staff has provided no concrete evidence to support their beliefs and conclusions. I conclude by asking council to review how staff exceeded its discretion when recommending the authorization to purchase the Tabin property with SDC funds. I urge council to clarify for staff the need to confine staff recommendations to use SDC funds to those projects that totally comply with city policies and state statutes. I ask council to rescind this use of stormwater SDCs and to offer alternative funds for the Taven purchase. I now ask each of you members of council to please turn to my document number four and pay at page seven, which is the last page of that document. And I will go into detail with your permission to talk about that document. That document is the table 6.6-9 from the council adopted 2000 storm water master plan. Note that the amount of money the council approved for the West Salem, the West Bank Basin, small conveyance improvement allowance. Compare that number with the November 2019 expenditure authorization. The two numbers do not match. Staff has claimed that this is no problem. I disagree. Staff has either ignored the city's adopted documents or is offering opinion conclusions unsupported by evidence. I would ask you to also consider the following. The 2002 system development charge study affirms the per basin allocation of the 5% monies. And I quote, costs include a 5% allowance for unspecified but anticipated small system conveyance projects within each basin as included in the master plan. That allocation was shown on table 69 for the West Bank Basin as it is for the other eight ba uh, basins. And that fund is specifically allocated amongst the nine basins. If you read the next line on page 14, of the 2002 system development charge study. It reads as follows. 
system-wide note the five percent conveyance allocation does not talk about system-wide so system-wide costs are also included such as a monitoring modeling inventory water quality facilities and stream habitat improvements in aggregate all these identify the improvements 13.5 percent of costs are to growth so we have a, a clear demarcation between the different percentage fundings in above the specific projects members of the council you can delegate authority but you cannot delegate responsibility when the council approved the purchase of the Taven property you tapped into a two million dollar staff control fund tucked away from citizen and council scrutiny yet you authorized the Taven land purchase expenditure without asking staff three questions do you does your recommendation comply with city policy does your recommendation meet the state legal requirements and three does your recommendation address all the fiscal restrictions placed upon the funding source staff has shown its ability to stonewall challenges by not answering follow-up questions from Salem residents and by offering explanations that contradict table six nine it is time for this council to require more of city staff it is time for this council to evaluate the authority acceded to staff thank you mr mayor members of the council i am happy to respond to questions thank you mr easterly uh, councillor anderson Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Ian, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I unfortunately, I'm not able to see anyone. Um, let's see, share well, screen with you. This is Councillor Anderson asking you a question. Go ahead, Tom. Thank you. Yeah, um, and I can hear it. Go ahead, Tom. Thank you. Um, EM, first of all, I um, appreciate the detail of your research and your attempts to keep the council uh, and staff in track, but I do have a couple questions. Uh, I'm looking at the, the first of your questions about comply with council policy, and I'm also looking about you saying the staff has uh, abused its discretion in the recommendation. Now, it seems to me, and maybe I'm wrong, EM, but reading between the lines, it seems to me that what you're really going after here is not the legal issue of spending fees from SDC for stormwater or not, but it's your concern that buying this piece of property might be used kind of as a stalking horse to uh, uh, expand, uh, to move Marine Drive into that very area. Is that your main concern? Uh, no, Cal, Councillor Anderson. I'm one of these I daughter T crosser sort of folk who are more concerned in if we have rules, play by them, and if you don't like the rules, change them. Okay, so this is not in any sense on your part some sort of, uh, I don't know, I guess I would just say rear guard or backdoor attack on your concerns about Marine Drive. It's just, here's what the law says, rules are rules, gosh darn it, they gotta be obeyed. That is correct, and let me go a little further in the written version of my material my i think it's my second sentence i said i don't want you i don't want the city to not have this piece of property i think there are positive reasons for having it yeah. however i am more deeply concerned because the way the city acquired it opened up a basket load of what i would call it, it, efforts on the part of staff to do something constructive but in the process, they have sort of gone around the, the set of rules that we're all supposed to play with. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that answer and it helps me here. Councilor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Easterly for your testimony. Uh, you talked a lot about staff 
abusing their discretion, but this was ultimately a city council decision. So I'm, I'm confused by your argument because really it's, it was our decision to purchase this property. Staff provided this information. Hold on. Staff provided this with information, but ultimately we made the decision to purchase the property. The city council did. We heard about it in the executive session prior, and then we made a decision in the public meeting. So I'm confused as to why, how that, how staff's information to us is relevant here. The, the succinct answer that I can give you, Councillor Hoy, is that as a land purchase, the reasons and justification for that purpose are handled in an executive session. What staff told you, what staff recommended to you is not part of the public purview, nor was there even a public hearing. This decision was on the consent calendar. Just happened. Yeah. We don't know why we've been told by Mr. Davis this evening that there were several reasons. That's all well and good, but the staff has also said that they believe that the only issue here is the expenditure of SDC funds. I have put forth over the last four months a whole series of questions that staff has decided from their point of wisdom that they don't need to be answered. That's why I gave you, the council members, a list of some of those questions from the last four months. So yes, as I said in my testimony, it is council's responsibility. It was a council decision. I'm challenging the legality of that decision because the I's weren't dotted. Right now, council is saying, I'm sorry, um, there, the 5% uh, ditches and pipes conveyance is just like the other areas that I wrote about. That is incorrect. The pipes and ditches 5% is clearly enunciated and clearly for each separate basin. And because of that, the funding as well as the purpose issues set out in the stormwater master plan just haven't been met. Thank you, EM. Okay, any other questions? Okay, Steve Anderson. Uh, excuse me. Did you have a question? Yes, I did. Okay. <clears throat> uh, EM, Jim Lewis, nice to see you. And I want to uh, want to compliment you on your preparation and uh, presentation tonight. As usual, it's, it's very good, very thorough. I've read through your comments. I've also read the comments that have been sent to the city council and I got to be honest, Ian, I find something dramatically missing, and I'll put it this way. You are referred to as the parliamentarian of the West Salem Neighborhood Association. And I've seen you over the years bring issues to that neighborhood association time and time again. But yet there's no comment from the neighborhood association. Can you tell me why this was not brought up in the neighborhood association meetings? Uh, excellent question, Jim Lewis. Uh, Councillor Lewis, I chose to not put this into a neighborhood brouhaha because the fundamental issue is one of legalism, not in behalf of a neighborhood association, but on behalf of the city as a whole. If you wanted to me to go into a long list of other examples where this or a future or a past council have adopted decisions connected with uh, master plans, comprehensive plan, comprehensive plan map that are far beyond the scope of an immediate problem, I would be more than happy to do that. But I made a conscious choice of not trying to get support from the neighborhood association because let's face it, members of council, I am challenging a process of interaction between city staff and city council. And I don't think that's something that belongs within the preview of the, the purview of a neighborhood association. Thank you, EM. Anyone else? Okay, Steve Anderson, thanks EM. 
Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Steve Anderson, uh, 3240 Geller Road, Northwest. Uh, Mr. Fernandez and staff have not answered all the relevant questions here and they have not provided sufficient evidence to support their case and their findings of facts are incorrect. This failure to answer questions about the Tabin property being needed for stormwater management seems to show that this was not the real intent and purpose of this purchase. Why the infrastructure provision was added suggests a transportation system. Mr. Fernandez clearly told council one thing and did another. These stormwater funds are spent contrary to council adopted stormwater management plans, the rule of law, and uh, the agenda set forth by Mr. Fernandez was not providing the buffer as stated, but some other reason. The infrastructure provision clearly shows another motive here. Council adopted its stormwater management plan has a 5% allocation for small conveyance projects. And this is where this case really turns on within specific basins. The properties in the West Bank Basin, the current 5% allocation for that is $200,000. The Octavian property spent $400,000, which is clearly over the 200,000 5% allocation. Here's where the case turns. Is that right, uh, viable or not? Stormwater management plan says no. Mr. Fernandez claims that the five-year allocation across occurs applies off across all basins. The management stormwater management plan says no. It's basin by basin, not a t in total. There is a 2019 proposed stormwater management plan not adopted by council yet that has language that's a little more lenient in the application of this allocation. However, this proposed plan has not been applied and is not in force. It's not been voted on. City Attorney Mr. Atchison has suggested that staff has from time to time gotten ahead of itself and used proposed policies as if they were adopted by council. U.S. Council has approved this misappropriations of stormwater funds. That is true, but you did not have all the facts and you made an illegal decision because you were given an illegal representation. Contrary to master, the stormwater master plan, the rule of law, and there's an important legal precedent cited by the testimony, Mr. Lee Morrison in this testimony of this in a previous case where the district court said that it was used inappropriately. You can correct this error tonight, but I fear if you don't, you're gonna be guilty of, saying, guilty of saying one thing and doing another over this, this particular issue. I believe you are better servants than this. I say that in my Friday attached testimony to you. Consider my alternative for grant Mr. Easter's these appeal. I mean, I don't want council to be in a position of affirming or rubber stamping recommendations with unsupported facts that were contrary to law. My alternative is to pass a motion instructing Mr. Fernandez and staff to remove the infrastructure provision and declare specifically that the Tabin property is part of Wallace Marine Park, thus restoring the action that was recently proposed to council that makes this the needed stormwater management protection and a buffer for Wallace Marine Park. So thank you and I testify tonight because I think there's been a great injustice and staff has taken liberty here and council has not been given all the information they need to make a proper decision. So thank you again. Thank you very much. Okay, any questions for Mr. Anderson? Yes, Councillor Anderson. Thank you. Uh, thanks for testifying, Mr. Anderson. I guess I'll ask you the same question I asked Mr. Easterly and it sounds like you are more of the belief that this might, reading between the lines, might be sort of a stalking horse for Marine Drive when you talk about infrastructure and transportation. Is that your view? Not necessarily. I mean, I think what council was representative first was the stormwater buffer, but when you were given the information, the Marine Drive or transportation systems was in that proposal. I believe that primarily you as council were not given all the facts in this matter and what you were given caused you to make an illegal action. You have said as a council over and over again, as I've listened to you, policy and procedure and the rule of law is important. This is a precedent setting case where you will make action contrary to the rule of law and the procedures that you've adopted as a council without going through due process. Hey, thank you very much. All right. Any questions then for Glenn Davis? Councillor Anderson? Or Mr. Fernandez, he just popped up here. Okay, um, I first have a question for Mr. Davis and I don't think we can do this because I don't know if, if you're still on the share screen mode, but I'm looking at your first slide, uh, Mr. Davis, where you, um, 
uh, uh, showed the property in question and then showed a map of the general area. And, oh, good, you're getting on there. Uh, uh, your first slide, if you could, Glenn. Yes, yeah, that was it. And I'm just a little confused because that doesn't seem to be an accurate map. It shows a non-existent street south of the subject property. How come Marine Drive is in there? Um, I believe it's unimproved right of way. I don't have the map uh, in front of me, but it is right of way. Okay, well, it looks Marine Drive Northwest looks the same as Tabin Road and Glen Creek Road and Wallace Road. There's no at all differences. So uh, I'm just curious as to why that uh, showed up there. Yeah, it's, it's, I believe it's just an unimproved right of way. That, that's, that's from the, the, our tax map. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, and I do have a question for Director Fernandez, too, Mr. Mayor, if I may. Certainly. Um, Mr. Fernandez, on, on a number of occasions going way back, I don't know, I think it was in Mr. Mayor's first term as mayor, we've had a lot of discussions about how we're going to spend the $3.6 million that is left and allocated for for Marine Drive in the last streets and bond measure we passed, or the one in two, 2008. And there has been quite a bit of concern on the council that we do not want this property, uh, uh, this money, $3.6 million, to be used to uh, uh, purchase right of way uh, on the curve to the east that would then go down to where the uh, Marine Drive is shown. That is between, uh, um, oh, there's a senior uh, uh, low-income housing project there, a Pioneer Village, and Wallace Marine Park. That's been a big concern, and we've had a lot of questions, and we have also discussed this in uh, um, several other uh, public and private sessions, including the executive dis discussion, when we talked about the reasons for purchasing the subject property. So with all that in mind, I'm just a little confused why all the reports we get keep talking about potential for uh, a purchase of Marine Drive right of way. Do you think that's the council's direction to you or do you need better direction from us to tell you that's what you shouldn't be doing? Well, Councilor, thank you. Um, Peter Fernandez, Public Works Director. Uh, the council direction on the bond money uh, is to spend it north of Fifth Street. And that is exactly what we have done. In fact, council uh, received a report uh, last meeting, a couple of meetings ago, about uh, our purchases for, for uh, the use of that money. And we are almost spent, and all of that has been based on council direction. This piece of property, when it, when it came to our attention, uh, uh, when, we had the, when I had the discussion with council, uh, I expressed to council first that we recognized that, uh, uh, that we were not allowed to spend one penny of the bond money south of Cameo, uh, that there was a lot of concern on council with respect to the uh, this piece of Marine Drive, uh, but that this piece of Marine Drive is still in the transportation system plan and has been since the year 2000. Uh, I know there's a lot of concern because uh, related to the third bridge, because uh, Marine Drive, which was already in the transportation system plan, was uh, basically absorbed into that into that uh, project and that pro and uh, made part of the project, but when that project went away, uh, Marine Drive is still there and it's still there as a collector street, and it's still there as a collector street that's been planned since the mid 1990s. Recognizing this is actually good urban planning and good transportation planning, recognizing before one iota of uh, the apartments uh, east of Wallace Road were developed, that we anticipated they were gonna be developed and we needed that transportation system parallel to the uh, uh, to Wallace Road and so that's why it's there. So when, we, when I came to council and I discussed this with you, uh, I talked about all of that and I said, you know, given all of those issues, uh, it is important that we acquire this property first and foremost, because it's a great acquisition as a buffer uh, to that creek that is there. There's actually 
several other properties. If you look at the aerial, I actually uh, brought it up and have it in front of me. There's several other properties uh, between Glen Creek Road and uh, uh, Pioneer Village that if they come up for sale, I'd be back to council uh, suggesting that we acquire them uh, because they are a good buffer for that creek and, uh, and ultimately for, for the park. Yes, that is marine drive, uh, potential marine drive right away. And yes, someday, uh, if the council directs, uh, we may proceed with marine drive and then uh, those pieces would be reimbursed uh, to whatever, because we're not using right-of-way funds, so to whatever funds we use to acquire them. So that's not a secret. Uh, I spoke to that to council. It's in the transportation system plan. Mr. Davis's presentation shows it. Uh, but for now, what that property is, is buffer property uh, for the creek. It's a uh, uh, stormwater detention property. Uh, by removing the house, we actually reduced impacts. We created uh, capacity for the, for the stormwater system. And that's, that's all there is to that, to that uh, property until such time in the future if, if the council directs to do something different with it. Thank you, Mr. Fernandez. I appreciate your uh, public recognition that of council's directive on spending on the right of way. And I appreciate the fact that uh, that money's almost gone north of where Fifth Street runs into uh, Marine Drive. And I appreciate that very much. And I'm glad to get that established. I'll also say that, um, you know, I voted for this because uh, for the purchase, because I can see those sorts of uh, the stormwater acquiring more land next to a very popular city park. Uh, and I also agree we'll be able to purchase some right away on Marine Drive because I think it's appropriate to get some traffic relief off Wallace Road. The only difference I think that, uh, well, I don't know difference, but my only view is it should go through Fifth Avenue and not through, not around and down to Taven and there. And uh, that's been expressed by a number of the, count, the council, uh, a number of members of the council. So I appreciate the fact that um, you're acknowledging both that the right-of-way money has been used north of where Fifth Avenue comes in and that um, maybe in the future this might happen, but for right now it is uh, uh, for the purposes that, uh, that we've discussed, that is acquisition of parkland and uh, storm water uh, drainage sort of situation. So thank you. You're muted, yeah. Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, you're muted. Did your hand go up? I did. Well, go for it. Excellent, thank you. But you can't, can't hear over the mute? I, I can't. You, I was yelling. Sir. Whiteboard <laughs> there hanging. Um, questions of staff. Have have we reimbursed portions of SDC purchase property for their resales or uses previously? Uh, I believe that that has occurred in the past. Um, how do we ID stormwater facilities for the plan? Do we consider properties that are not currently available or that are not currently, or that are currently developed? Do we even look at those in our planning process or is it more of an opportunity uh, as it comes up in this case, that that would be recommended. So let me start, and then Glenn can Glenn can fill in uh, some portions. If I don't answer your question completely, uh, the the first thing that's important to note is that the stormwater SDC methodology is very old. Uh, it was actually an interim methodology back when it was adopted in 2000. Uh, because of that, it really uh, collects very little money. Uh, it's a very small SDC, and I know that. Uh, uh, the committee that Councillor Anderson was good enough to uh, chair for us that looked at all of the SDC methodologies uh, last year, year before last, uh, passed on the stormwater SDC because the master plan needs to be updated and we've been working on that. Uh, so it doesn't generate a whole lot of money. So there isn't, there isn't a whole lot uh, to be able to do the projects that are listed in the 309 list. So a lot of the, of the stormwater SDC money goes to reimburse developers for SDC eligible stormwater projects that they do. So the little money that's left is then available for either partially funding a project, and then there is some amount, as we have with all SDCs 
uh, to for opportunities. And uh, so this is, we don't have a list of properties uh, because that's not in the 309 list, but as opportunities present themselves, and, and we've had this in the past, and we've had opportunity purchases for rights of way and for water projects. I mean, this happens all the time. <laughs> then we come to council and say, hey, here's an opportunity. It's not listed. We go through a discussion with the council because if it were on the plan, then it'd be easier. So it requires more discussion. And, and, uh, and, and it, we did that in this case. So Glenn, is there, did I miss anything? Um, I, I would just make one clarification that, um, and nothing, no, no correction, that, that uh, the methodology establishes costs, growth costs, and the growth costs are established by totaling all the needs in every basin. And so it, it, it comes up with a grand total of all costs in all basins. And that becomes the basis for the fee, the fee that we're charged based on that growth cost. And then there is a this list made, this was called the 309 list that has all the projects on it. And um, and Mr. Council Anderson is very aware of this from the committee he was on that that those those costs are not limited to one area. They are citywide. It's a, it's a citywide system, and so when that when those costs are aggregated in the 309 list, like the five percent issue, it's not limited to each basin. That's that's one of the, the the basic ideas. The costs are calculated for each basin, but the expenditures are not limited that way. So I just want to make that clarification. Uh, that that's uh, that's kind of how we got here. But but all the all the systems have this. Um, opportunity money that's available that you just can't predict. And sometimes you don't, you don't have a lot of time to wait to, to have to go back and amend the list for each individual thing. So that, that's, that's pretty universal to all the other methodologies. Brad, did you have a follow-up? Yes, I did. And, and thank you for that, because I know that the more we restrict any individual component inside of our systems, um, if there is a project that can perform um, with a 90% improvement versus several that are down in the one or two percentages, it would be to our advantage to, to go for a larger improvement. But there was a, a question that uh, Mr. Easterly brought up and brought a question to mind um, regarding um, the demolition of the structure on the property. And so my assumption is that SDC funds allow modification of the property. We would ex have to excavate in the, in the event we wanted to make a detention basin. So is there a difference between excavation or demolition or any other improvements on a piece of property to serve as a, a stormwater facility? Yeah, we don't, we don't think so. In this case, uh, actually removing the property uh, removed uh, impervious area, so it actually increased capacity and in small quantities there's no question about that uh you know if we were here discussing how stormwater sdc's built a new apartment building uh or built a roadway then then i think we'd be in trouble but but we feel that it was perfectly appropriate to scrape the land and and leave it clean specifically to allow for uh uh for bet for better flow of uh of uh, of stormwater uh in that area for absorption and uh and uh, uh, detention and flow. Sir Lewis, you had a question? Thank you. Yeah, actually a couple of quick ones. Uh, I'll address this to the attorneys in the room, but if the city, uh, city attorney is available. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> this is, I'm just curious, um, in the event that this appeal was turned down, does the appellant have any recourse? Uh, Dan Atchison, city attorney. My apologies for no video tonight, uh, uh, camera problems. Um, the, the appellant should obviously check with his own attorney, but there is a, a process to go to circuit court uh, to uh, challenge the city council's decision. Okay, and uh, one last question, if I could. Um, this refers back to Councilor Anderson's comments about the alignment of Marine Drive um, as depicted in the Salem Transportation Plan, I believe, and I'll, this is a question, does the city council have the right to amend the transportation plan? And if they do, has there been any attempt to do that? Uh, the council absolutely has the right to amend the transportation system plan. There is a process that's required by the Department of Land Conservation and Development. Uh, and no, there has not been 
uh, an attempt to amend the plan. What there has been is direction on how to spend the money, and we've understood, uh, clearly understood that direction and have followed it. Thank you. Very good. Any further? Councillor Kayser. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have a couple of questions, um, and some have already asked some of my questions, so thank you. Um, so, uh, Dr. Fernandez, uh, Mr. Davis, I'm looking at uh, the agenda we had, council agenda from November 25th of last year. And on there in the summary um, about the acquisition of this property, it says the city's interested in acquiring property for stormwater detention and potential future right away from Marine Drive Northwest. And I think this gets perhaps to the crux of Mr. Easterly's um, issue. <laughs> and this is the question is, um, is the city allowed to expend stormwater SDC funds for future right of way? Or even, I mean, even if it's not explicitly for that, but the idea that it could become that in the future, is that, I mean, it's it's platted right of way, um, or it's, it's you know, it's on the map because that's how it is. It's, it's, it's right of way, but it just has never been developed. Um, the city might not own it. I don't exactly know exactly. But is that an appropriate use, or can we use SDC funds to do that stormwater? I just, I personally don't know. I don't know okay. the law around that, but. Um, yeah. So let me add a couple of clarifications for you, Councillor. Uh, the right of way through that area is not, it, on that parcel is not platted. So what we have is what I would call a magic marker line on the transportation system plan. Uh, which says, hey, someday, if a developer uh, came to develop that property, for example, we would require the right-of-way dedication at that point. Uh, uh, in answer to your question directly, uh, no, stormwater SDC funds cannot be used uh, to acquire uh, transportation right-of-way. If the council ever directed that uh, Marine Drive go through there, then whatever funds that would be used for uh, uh, the the uh, development of the of the street would reimburse the stormwater SDCs, like Councillor uh, Nanke was asking. Uh, I recall in our discussions uh, saying specifically that one of the reasons uh, there was certainly the stormwater and the and the open space, but uh, we certainly recognized that that this is potentially part of Marine Drive right of way. And it's unfortunate that uh, that Mr. Anderson specifically says that there's some kind of nefarious thing going on that that I might do. And I was very clear with the council, and the staff report is very clear that yes, Mar Marine Drive right of way is there and is a possibility for the future. And we wanted to make that perfectly clear that in the future that is a possibility for that right of way. And uh, I was clear with the council when we had the conversation, and we were clear in the staff report. So just yes, to, Councilor if, I, if I can follow up, yeah, thank you. you so just to um, put it in terms that I can understand, um, there is no marine drive platted right now on this property. There Not is no marine drive platted on this property it, it at all. Right there. So if we were to say, well, yeah, we want to acquire right away, build that road, that would essentially come out of a different fund. Like you would reimburse the SDC fund to, I, I, yeah, however that works, but there would be a, a transfer of monies to accommodate that piece that is no longer a part of the storm water detention, whatever we're doing with the property. That is correct, Councilor. Okay. Councilor that's, Anderson. That's oh, very, I'm sorry, Kara, go ahead. Sorry. That's a very important distinction from my, my point of view. Um, and really quick, I have just uh, another question, is what's the current state of the property? Like what has the city done as far as making it part of the stormwater system Right. At this point, it is a semi-natural uh, property, uh, you know, awaiting. Uh, at some point, we might do some uh, 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 stream bank improvements. Uh, uh, at some point, we might create a detention basin. Uh, we might plant trees on it. Uh, so at this point, we don't have, we haven't done anything at this point to it, okay. other than other than scrape it. All right. Thank you. Okay. Tom? Thank you, Mr. Fernandez. I think it's nefarious that you think that I thought you were nefarious, and I object to that, and I'm offended by it. And uh, I would have to Mr. Anderson, not Councillor Anderson. Yeah, uh, Councillor uh, S O N. I'm sorry. It's oh. it's. Oh, <laughs> oh, okay. Anderson. 
Right. Okay, when you say you're the non-nefarious Andrew. Yeah, I'm, okay. <laughs> I've been. I, I'm sorry, Peter. When you said I'm Mr. sorry, counselor. I presume you were talking about me, and I thought, no, wow. sir. Yeah. No, sir. <laughs> okay. So, Peter, I take back my offensiveness, and uh, uh, I appreciate the clarification. I'm uh, sorry. And if you would have said Mr. Anders' son, I might have So thank you I think we're almost there on closing this public hearing. So, so I'm sorry, I'm yes, sorry. Councillor Nordyke. I accused you of that. Councillor Nordyke. Thank you. The staff report makes clear that it is for stormwater funds and that future use of the property, if it is allowed for transportation purchases, would require reimbursement. Yeah. I don't see an issue here. Yeah, that's all exactly. I have to say. I, I appreciate everyone else's questions. I've been listening carefully. Yeah. Thank you for your time, everyone. Thank you for summarizing this, Councillor. That's very yeah, helpful. Deliberations. We need to get towards that. We're gonna. Yeah, we're gonna close this public hearing. Um, can I add something first before you close it? Yeah. Go for it. Sorry, I don't have my my uh, camera on. Um, the main thing I just wanted to mention was like, you know, the, the, the fact that the house was torn down. I mean, this is a kind of housing that Salem keeps saying that we need. So, I mean, I, I just have some major concerns. Like, I mean, I know we can't do anything about the house being gone now, but that is something to keep in consideration. Mayor, if I may. Uh, Councilor, Councilor we, uh, we often acquire uh, properties that have homes on it. And if the homes are, are livable, are, are in good shape, uh, we often have the housing authority uh, manage them for us uh, before uh, there's other things. My understanding is that this house was actually uh, needed a lot of repair and it was really uh, not, not quite right for, uh, for what the housing authority would need. But, but we do consider that and we do do that. Okay. Okay, without... And Mayor, Dominic excuse me. Uh, the app, the appellant has a rebuttal oh, time that's of right. seven I'm minutes. I'm sorry, EM. You've got how many minutes? Seven. Seven. There you are. Okay. I'll turn on your, there you go. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I do understand. I listen to and appreciate the broader conversation. I, I appreciate Mr. Fernandez's explanation. There is one key problem here. The opportunity of using monies for a purpose, as he expressed across all SDCs, is important and significant. However, until the stormwater master plan is adjusted, you, we the city, must conform to the requirements of what the monies for the 5% can be used for. Specifically, it says $200,000 to be used for pipes and, dish and ditches. Not an opportunity to go floating for something. More importantly, 40% plus of this lot is already within the Salem storm area, the flood plain. That doesn't need reconstruction. I agree with him in terms of maybe the banks could have been improved, but buying the property without defining what the specific conveyance project is, does not conform with the language of the 2000 Storm Salem Stormwater Master Plan. And that little piece of talking broadly about what our intent as a member of the staff and public works department is great. What they didn't do is provide the specifics in terms of what the restrictions are on that amount of money that's called the 5% conveyance under the current plan. That is a major issue for me. That is one of the things that if you read through all of the documents that I've discussed, they become extremely important. Uh, Public Works published a response 
to my document four and it was presented to you as a counsel. I responded to that directly to Dr. Chandler. I pointed out the specific things that I read in my oral testimony, raising the issues, are we actually following what that plan, old as it is, requires and needs to be considered. And it is my rebuttal argument that the city has not, and that there is an obligation on the city's part to make sure that the three questions I asked, are you following the rules? Does the funding source, in this case, the SDC monies, stormwater SDCs, are they being used in the way defined in the plan? And pipes and ditches are not the same thing as buying land. Had Mr. Fernandez had come to you and said, let's deal with this issue after the new plan was developed, I probably wouldn't have had an issue. I do now because quite frankly, there has been no evidence offered to me in the discussion. As Mr. Fernandez said, I'm not going to use what, uh, monies from, uh, I'll use my own example, parks to buy transportation. I'm suggesting you need to have a specific plan of what you meant by a conveyance improvement. So if the city uh, public works say, okay, we're going to expand the floodplain and put a detention basin there, then I, I go away quietly. But until then, I remain most concerned about the fact that the I's were not really dotted and the T's not crossed. Thank you very much. I Thank you. Okay, now I'm gonna close the public hearing. Okay, public hearings closed. Councilor Hoy. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move the City Council deny the appeal brought pursuant to SRC 41.180C regarding the use of stormwater system development charge SDC funds for the purchase of real property at 298 Taven Road Northwest. Second. Second by Nordyke. Okay. You want to discuss your motion or do you feel we've had a I don't I feel like we've discussed it thoroughly. I've uh, listened to all the arguments and uh, I don't believe the appeal has merit. Okay. Councilor Nanke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, uh, I, I do want to thank Mr. Easterly for bringing this in front of us. Um, he has always had that parliamentarian piece, which I have as well. And, you know, 20 years ago, he he said that it'll, it'll be amazing the difference as a, a normal citizen versus a city councilor um, and the ramifications of the decisions we make. And so he brought forth a very good argument uh, in regard regards to our use of city funds. Um, and, and I do believe we need to there's a discrepancy in terms we need to tighten up our legislation to make sure we have the flexibility <laughs> um, and make sure that is um, apparent inside of our rules so that we can utilize um, our funds as appropriate base and wide and, and make sure that essentially we have the flexibility to utilize SDC funds um, to where no one could bring this kind of appeal to us. Um, you know, conveyance improvements, um, opportunity purchases, we need to make sure we can take maximum advantage of them no matter where they lie inside of the city of Salem. Uh, there was an email that came in regarding this, talked about the, uh, the 12th Street improvement, which is why I'm sitting here today. And... Uh, I, I take those elements very seriously of the way our rules are configured and the, and the way the citizens uh, look at those. And, uh, you know, it's a tough decision, but, you know, we all voted for this and um, 
it is a good opportunity to purchase if in fact there's right of way that's associated with this down the line, those funds will be reimbursed as well. But I just wanna make sure that um, people don't have to question the way our rules are written. And I know that's always hard. And so um, I would ask staff to, uh, to look at that phrasing, even with the, the new updates to make sure we're as tight or as loose as, as we actually need to be to allow for our own flexibility. Thanks. Thanks, Councilor. Councilor Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. There's been some uh, reference to my serving on uh, an SDC committee to review everything, and I certainly did. I was chair of that group that met over a year and a half for over 30 meetings, and we thoroughly discussed all this area. And um, uh, while I appreciate the issues raised by Mr. Easterly, I also am confident in the staff and their analysis of this. That's based on a year and a half of weekly workings with everyone from Director Fernandez down to um, Director, uh, Assistant Director Chandler to Mr. Davis and also to uh, Alicia Blaylock, who, who I had a lot of discussion with too. So, um, you know, I'm confident in the staff's view of this, that is the 5% is not based on one basin, but it's based overall. And uh, so I'm gonna vote for the motion. Great, thank you. Councilor Lewis. Yeah, uh, follow up to Councilor Anderson. I, um, 10 years on the Planning Commission and five years on this body, I have gained a great deal of respect for the, uh, for the city employees, especially those in the Public Works Department. I am gonna say, as, uh, as uh, Director Fernandez alluded to, it is disappointing to have, um, to have folks make accusations against our employees and um, and especially, and I will, uh, I will say uh, the comments from Mr. Anderson were especially disappointing to me as a, as a member of the West Salem area. Um, and I just, I wanted to make that clear. Okay, anyone else? Um, I would like to add um, yes, something. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I kind of want to echo some of what uh, Councillor Nangi has said. Um, specifically, he had mentioned, uh, at least from my, what, what I understood from his statement, there was concerns about this acquisition and what it means. Um, I do find it problematic we're still moving forward with the denial considering the rules were not tight. Like, it just seemed to me that rules were not tightened enough and there's some real concerns about whether we may have abused SD, um, SDC funds. And um, so, um, my, I'm probably going to be the only one voting this direction, but I'm going to be voting um, against deny, denying the appeal. I just wanted to make sure that was um, known. We'll call on you and let you make it official. Anyone else? Councillor Kayser. Thank you. Um, it became clear to me through questions of staff that um, the, the intent of this purchase is for stormwater retention, detention, um, and I don't necessarily agree that you have to have a very, uh, you need to have a well-defined plan about what that is, if there's an opportunity purchase. Um, and I don't know, I don't know what statute says, but I'm relying on staff with their interpretation and their expertise there. Um, but in looking at other opportunity purchases we've made as a council over the last, since I've been on council, I know that we don't always go in with a plan. We just know that we could use that in the future for that purpose. I think. I think if we acquired it and then we say start building something completely different on there, then that would be that would be different. Um, that would be a, a misuse of, of those funds. Um, but this is this is not that case. And and if we were to do something else with the property, the the SDC would be reimbursed with the funds. So um, I I just I don't see this as being a, a, an abuse or a misuse of, of the funding, um, and it's uh, I'm going to support the motion. Excellent. Okay. All right. Why don't we uh, go ahead and call the roll? Councilor Nanke. Aye. Councilor Leung. Nay. Councilor Osik. Aye. Councilor Hoy. Aye. Councilor Nordyke? Aye. Councilor Lewis? Aye. Councilor Kayser? Aye. Councilor Anderson? Aye. Mayor Bennett? Aye. Motion passes.
Okay. Let me pull up my sheet here. Excuse me just a second. Okay, we'll move to special orders of uh, business. We'll start with uh, Councillor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that the City Council direct staff to provide a resolution for City, City Council's consideration to initiate the renaming of Center Street and the Center Street Bridge to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Dr. Martin Luther King Avenue and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Bridge, respectively, along with a report outlining the process and the potential procedure and legal issues associated with the renaming. Second. Second. Ooh, that was a quick one for- Second by Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I mentioned it earlier, but Salem has no prominent streets, parks, or other city properties honoring the importance of the civil rights movement. As Oregon's capital, our city should be leading the way in this effort. While there are many appropriate choices for such an honor, we should start with someone with a legacy that is understandable and relevant to our community. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is such a figure. Center Street and the Center Street Bridge are prominent within our community and are utilized by residents from all neighborhoods and visitors just passing through. Renaming Center Street will bring due attention to this real important issue. And uh, Mr. I invited Mr. Jones to speak tonight and he really captured the essence of why I brought this forward and I could not say anything more better than he did. And uh, just for the public's uh, edification watching this, this is, this is how we do our business here. This will get the process started if this motion passes. And we will, we will then have a public process where the, the, it'll go before the Planning Commission. People will have multiple opportunities to weigh in on this, to uh, discuss it, to maybe transform it if that needs to happen. But there, this is just to initiate that process. And uh, because Center Street also uh, travels out into the county, there will likely be conversations with the county commissioners and others. So this, this initi initiates the process, but there will be a lot of opportunity for public engagement and uh, public participation before this uh, takes place. Great, thank you, Councillor, for also explaining that there is a process being initiated here. I think that's helpful for folks to understand how this works. Okay, anyone else? Uh, Councillor Nanke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, again, I thank uh, Mr. Jones for bringing this forward. And I had contacted Councillor Hoy on Saturday because there was some vagueness to the motion as far as I know some other cities have designated a, a, a specific period of street. You know, the bridge, there's not an issue. When we're in downtown, every one of the property owners would have to change their address and letterhead and websites, likewise, citizens say beyond downtown. And so I just wanna make sure we're considering those and making sure we get public input as we move through that and make sure staff brings back a, a, whether or not, uh, and I think Councilor Coy mentions, or Hoy mentioned some other cities have an overlay is it a hard address or or what is it? I 100% I um, support um, us putting on Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Boulevard in the city of Salem. I, I came out of the Midwest. Um, I'm no stranger to the racial strife that we've seen. I was president of my high school class when we had forced integrated busing. My parents had lived through race riots back in the Midwest as well. And so we need to, to not only start this process, but work towards um, something that's meaningful that will, that will move our nation hopefully past this. And, and Dr. King's comments are so valid and poignant and, and they still reside today, you know, decades after um, this started because it's, it doesn't go away. Um, we, we need to address it head on. And this is a wonderful way um, for the city of Salem to, to begin that process. And, and he was a great man and I have no issues naming a street after 
or a bridge for that matter, um, after Dr. King. And uh, I just want to make sure that everybody knows what we're doing and we don't get blindsided at a public hearing as everybody has to change their <laughs> address. So we, we need to make sure we take that into account. Certainly. Thank you, Councillor. Yes, Councillor Nordyke. Thank you, Mayor. The time is always right to do what is right. And I want people to recognize, and I'd like to underscore the fact that this is one act out of many towards moving our city closer to peace, closer to racial equity and justice. So I want folks out there to recognize that this is not just a symbolic gesture. It is one step of many in the right direction. And I know that there are a number of homes and businesses on Center Street, and it would be wonderful to hear from them on this because I, I just think that a lot of folks would be excited to see, see what it might be like to have their address changed to Martin Luther King Boulevard. But anyway, I want to underscore uh, Councillor Hoy's comments. Thank you, Councillor, for bringing the motion. And thank you to Jonathan Jones for being the visionary who brought this to council in the first place. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lewis. Yes, uh, one step at a time. I'm, uh, I'm going to support the motion, but I'm gonna be real clear from this point forward. If we are going to be changing the name of a street, we better be talking to the people who are gonna be going through the pain and suffering of that change. Not sure how many are familiar with the name change of 39th Avenue in Portland to Cesar Chavez Boulevard, but that seven mile road um, change, the city council passed unanimously and it took years to get it implemented. In fact, they had to make a deal with the residents that we would keep both names for five years. It was not an easy process. It was not a unanimous process. My concern is, and as a, as a young man who listened to Dr. King many times, I don't believe he would agree to bring suffering to others to get recognition for himself. So I will be supporting this motion to look at it, but I will not be supporting the change of the street unless we can verify that the people's addresses and the pain and suffering will not happen. Okay. All right. Everybody ready to vote? Councilor Kayser, you're ready to vote or are you wanting to talk? One brief comment. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks to Councilor Hoy for bringing this and also for Jonathan Jones for having the idea and contacting us. And, and I agree, I think, with uh, the comments other councilors have made that this is a this is not the, the end all be all, we're gonna do this and I'll be better. That's certainly not the goal at all. This is a an act of recognition that's that's frankly long overdue. Um, and within Oregon especially. Um, uh, it's 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 needed. So, and I think if we can do this to to help um, bring community together to to continue the dialogue and, and work for um, solutions, then then this is good. Very good. Can I add something too? Everybody, where are you, Jackie? Yeah. There you Sorry. go. Thank you. Um, so my thought behind this is I think this is a great start, but we also need to make sure that we have a lot more ways to go than just um, renaming a street. I think this, you know, considering that it was brought forth by a community member and that's why I'm in support of, of that. But I also think that we need to do more than just renaming the streets. We have to look towards more towards, you know, what are other ways that we could continue building within our community? What does it look like to heal? What does it look like to rebuild trust, especially within the black indigenous and people of color? So those are some considerations I hope city council thinks about, especially as we move forward with our work together. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councillor Anderson. Thank you, the quote from Dr. King, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And this is just the first attempt to bend that arc toward justice. Very good, any other? All right, why don't we have the roll call then? Councilor Leung. Aye. Councilor Osik. Councilor Osik. Okay, I'll go back. Councilor Hoy. Aye. Councilor Nordyke. Aye. Councilor Lewis. Aye. Councilor Kayser. Aye. Councillor Anderson? Aye. Councillor Nanke? Aye. 
And let's go back to Councillor Osig. I couldn't hear you. Aye. Okay, great. And Mayor Bennett. Aye. Okay, motion passes unanimously. Very good. Councillor Hoy. You're Thank you, Mr. Aye. Mayor. For purposes of discussion, I move approve the city council approve expansion of the park rangers duties and service area to better serve the community's needs. Second. Who seconded? Who seconded? Well, I got it. I oh, you got it. it. I just want someone to do it. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I I mentioned I pulled this item because uh, in reading it, I have a lot of concerns uh, based on the staff report. In, in a conversation with staff, my my concerns may have been assuaged slightly, but what this does is we're we're taking what I think is a really important function, which is that of the park ranger, and we're expanding it to basically be a code enforcement officer or code compliance officer. The, the position has already moved from parks over to community development, which is a concern for me because that sort of right there tells me that the focus is really on, uh, on code compliance more than it is on being a park ranger. If we need more code compliance officers, and we certainly do, and we're no longer interested in the park ranger, we ought to eliminate the position and create a code compliance officer that's available to all wards and all areas of the city. Now, I understand that the staff is saying, well, the idea is that this, this position will now be available to, to all the parks. It doesn't say that in the staff report. The motion doesn't say that. It's not stated anywhere. Uh, I understand uh, that that might be the intent. That's not what it says. And I'm frankly skeptical that the parks out in my ward will actually ever see the park ranger. And um, there's already certain areas of this city that receive an inordinate, inordinate amount of services compared to the outlying areas. When I ran for city council, my, you know, what I promised to be is the voice for the people in ward six. And I feel like if I support this motion, I will be, uh, I will not. I will be betraying that statement and that the reason that I, I ran. And because we need services throughout the city, we need an equitable service delivery. And I think that this proposal does not get us closer. I think it takes us farther away, and I don't support it. Well, Councillor, I'm just curious. Do you think there would be uh, uh, it would be helpful to have a report within the next? I mean, we're going into our busiest time of year in the parks that the manager and his staff come back with a report and tell us how they're allocating. I think it, you make a very good point. I live in Northeast as well, and I know that is a, a pervasive feeling uh, in various parts of the city. And I think it might be helpful sometime to actually have an accounting of how like a staff person like this time is, is used to see if it in fact represents the common wisdom on how city staff is used. Would that help with this, do you think? Well, it, he currently only can go into four different parks. Uh, well, this is to expand out. that. Yeah, this is to right, expand right. that. And it would we seem to put the onus on them to show how they're, how they're allocating. Well, I'm fine if they want to come back with another proposal that, that somehow ensures equitable service delivery, I'm, that's great. I just don't support this one. And I'm happy to consider something in the future if they, if staff have a different idea or a better way of explaining yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. That's okay with me. Yeah, okay. So you just don't want to have them in the other parks? I, I just want to understand. <laughs> I want to be able, <laughs> if we're going to create a code compliance officer, I want to have access to that in all okay. the words. In I'm a, just tracking you with you. All right, just uh -huh. tracking with you. Okay, who else? Sure. Who else but is getting ripped able, off out there? Come on. I want to confirm that we really are needing a park ranger and we're committed to the park ranger program. That's what I want. That's my bigger concern. Right. Well, let's get Norman on here and hear him make a commitment. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Norman Wright, Community Development Director. Um, I, please forgive me, but I'm at a little bit of a loss here. So our request um, is to take our existing park ranger and for the very reasons that you're describing, Counselor, we hope to give that park ranger the opportunity to serve all the parks as the need arises, recognizing that the park ranger today currently can only serve in the four parks that are mentioned in the staff report. Additionally, 
the park ranger does already enforce certain codes, uh, such as the leash laws within the park, as well as uh, a few other things that, uh, that we can highlight for you. But uh, the intent has always been to first uh, recognize that, yes, it is a park ranger, and as a park ranger, uh, his primary duties are to provide a presence as well as good outreach to our community members who enjoy these parks as well as to occasionally have to uphold certain rules that make our park experience the best it can be for everybody. We've waited over a year in order to carefully expand the duties to the full intent of the position, which includes these new SRCs that will now be capable of being enforced by the ranger himself or himself. Uh, but that being said, he is still primarily a park ranger. Uh, he still does the park ranger outreach and programming uh, that our our residents as well as the SPRAB uh, committee have come to really appreciate. And again, I just wanna stress that um, that will continue. And the request here is to allow him that ability to enforce a few other things that are really, I think, pretty necessary for him as complaints arise or as issues are uh, compel it. And to let that happen, not only in these four parks, but into all the parks of the uh, community, again, uh, where he can and how he can with the bandwidth that he's got. So, um, yeah, my, my apologies if the report is a little bit unclear here, but there is no way, shape, or form in which this is intended to become a code officer. Uh, instead, we want to just realize the full potential of the position and, again, offer it to the rest of the community as we can. Councilor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Wright. I guess I would just have to go back to what I'm, the only thing I have available to me is the staff report. The staff report talks about expanded duties. It talks about, um, it says the park ranger currently serves four of the city, or the 92 city parks. But it, and it talks about expanding as when directed by uh, uh, code compliance. That doesn't, that doesn't tell me that it's gonna come, what parks it's gonna go to, that it's gonna go to all 92 parks or that it's gonna do anything other than code compliance in those parks. I just, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't get it. Okay, so uh, a couple of things that may help there. Uh, the park ranger is a position that's housed within the code of compliance division uh, for neighborhood enhancement. And Suzanne Reynolds is here on the line. And so I'm gonna to turn to her for a minute to let her explain how she works and supervises the park ranger. But in terms of the expanded duties, uh, the explicit items that we wish to have the park ranger uh, have new duties for, be authorized for, are those items mentioned in the summary, which include SRC 47, uh, prohibited dumping and littering, which is a problem in some of these parks, right? As well as, of course, uh, the property maintenance, which can apply to junk vehicles actually in the parks. Um, and, or that, that those, well, you get the idea. And then, of course, parking. Uh, so Suzanne, uh, this is her first Zoom meeting. I had trouble with my first one. But Suzanne, if you're there, can you also talk a little bit about how um, you anticipate Mike's duties continuing and expanding and how that relates to code compliance, but more importantly with park ranger duties themselves? Yes, um, Suzanne Reynolds, code compliance supervisor. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, we definitely do not want um, Ranger Mike to become a code compliance officer. Um, we want him to stay within the park. The reason we originally had the idea to advance him to be able to go to other parks other than just the specific four was specifically because we have complaints from other parks. Um, I mean, Gear Park, for example, we get lots of individuals call us and ask if he can go there, if he could just have a presence so that people know he exists. Um, most of the city doesn't even know we have a park ranger unless you always hang out at those four parks. Um, Cascade Park or Cascade Gateway Park was a huge example of absolutely no one but park staff were in that park until very recently when we sent our staff in to just help monitor the situation and, and saw exactly what the needs are there. When we very first proposed this idea, it was um, to give, um, I call him Ranger Mike, sorry, um, <laughs> Park Ranger uh an opportunity to spread some of the cool things he does, like the Owl Watch and um, his Junior Ranger program to some of those areas that he doesn't serve. Um, right now, all those kids need to go 
to wherever he's doing those programs in those four parks. They can't be offered in other parks. And if another park is having an event, um, he isn't even supposed to go to those. He's supposed to stay in those four parks. Um, based on how council originally adopted this position. Um, you're right, um, Councilor Hoy, I, you know, that that isn't clear in this staff report, but that is fully our intent is to just get him to be able to go to other parks. And just the fact that he pulls up to them and walks through them is something that shows people that he's there watching them. There's a whole bunch of parks where we get complaints about just simple dog off leash. And then if you've been, I know um, Councilor Nordyke has been to Cascade there's a huge um, problem now, but it's not just because of the situation now where we have junk vehicles just dropped, stolen vehicles just dropped in, in the parks and they drive away. Um, Minto Brown, they do it there too. And we, we have to have the police go um, tow those vehicles away. This would allow him, he's already there, to just call the tow company, have them towed away. And it would stay, take one step out of um, police duties and code enforcement duties. It's not to give them code enforcement duties. Suzanne, uh, just a question for both you and Norman. Uh, in hearing you talk about your staff, the staff report that's presented and Councillor Hoy's concern that his only reliance can be on the staff report as presented, you feel like you might want to take this back and do some more work on it, get a little more specific and descriptive is exactly what it is you're talking about or do you think it this gives you what you need i am a little concerned when Councillor hoy uh is describing the problem he's got which is a staff report that doesn't say everything we're talking about does that make sense so yeah it, it makes sense mayor and we can certainly go back and rework it we're happy to i mean the, the main thing for me is that the staff report as, as we read it, and, and there were many of us who revised it, it reflected everything that we wanted uh, and we thought we could, uh, could, could effectively communicate. We can rework yeah. it, that's that's totally fine. You um, may have to get a little more specific, Norman. I mean, at least that's yeah. what I'm hearing. And I, I can certainly testify uh, to what uh, Councilor Hoy is saying, and I'm sure others who represent uh, uh, some of the north end of town can easily testify to a sense of service ambiguities, let's say. Uh, but in this case, I think ambiguity in this program might be uh, really more than is tolerable. If I may, Mr. Mayor, um, yeah. what, what I would say is that what concerns me is that we're expanding from four to 92, the number of parks they're responsible for, and also expanding the number of codes they're responsible for for enforcement of. And so it's one of those things where it feels like you're taking one person that yeah. was spread thin already and you're spreading him triply thin as opposed to saying, wait, maybe we should focus his uh, commitment and expand it to other parks. Because I completely agree with the idea that we would expand it to other parks. I just want to make sure he's actually able to go to those parks and do his duties there and not be uh, like one minute a day in each park. <laughs> yeah, well, we'd hope that that uh, uh, Mr. Wright and, and uh, Suzanne would hear what you're saying. I mean, that that might be part of, a, of an adapted parks or park ranger report that comes forward that reflects really what's going on out there. Yeah, Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I was a little confused by Suzanne's report where she talked about we have to call the police at Minto Brown. I thought Minto Brown was one of the four parks. They're Bush, Riverfront, Wallace, and what's the fourth park? Um, that Square. is Marion Square, yeah. Oh, Marion Square, okay. Uh -huh. then. So we're all wrong because I think the mayor thought. I was <laughs> yeah. So thanks. Uh, uh, my next question: uh, uh, I think that we had a quite a bit of discussion. Is this a half-time job? Is it a three-quarter job? Is it a full-time job? And I'm not sure where we landed, but I think we landed at a three-quarter job. Is that correct, Mr. Wright? It's a full-time position. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah, it's a full-time position. What it seems to me is, I think this is an admirable project. I think we need to have 
uh, um, um, the ranger out there, I guess I've got two uh, statements. The first one is I also thought that when we originally approved the park ranger, we were looking at more at the regional parks as opposed to the neighborhood smaller parks. So I'd like some discussion of that uh, because they're clearly Minto Brown, Cascade Gateway. Uh, there's a park out in Ward 6 by one of the high schools that has been getting a lot of attention. And I think those are all kind of regional parks. There's a park across from Fred Myers out there off River Road. That's another regional park as opposed to a smaller park. So uh, I'd like some discussion of smaller parks such as I'll just say Fairmont Park up in up in the Fairmont Hill versus a, a regional park that city people come from all over the city. The other thing is, this is the sort of thing that in my view that should have come to us in the budget process where we should have been told, hey, we're got a problem with four parks versus 88 other parks and we're already stretched thin with the one position of park ranger. Maybe we need 1.5 park rangers or maybe we need two point park rangers. So, you know, it's a, it's a little late in that process now, but I also understand it's summer and that's when we really need the person there. So I like a discussion of that as well. And is, if it's possible to say, gosh, when we look at the duties, we really need somebody else as a park ranger, whether it's full-time or part-time, and then a discussion of how that might be able to be done within our, with being fiscally responsible. Thanks. Councilor Nanke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I know when this position originally came up back in the, uh, the budget committee meeting several years back, there was a lot of discussion as well as far as limited parks, or should it be a police officer, or what will they be doing? Where will they be doing it? I, I I empathize with staff and, and thank you. And Suzanne's been around for a long time. Um, and I've worked with her for many years on that. And, and you know, we elected to have a park ranger. And so to, to restrict those parks that that officer or ranger could visit to me would be, um, and it was one of the conversations we had originally, they should be able to, frequent any park based on its need, but again, knowing that we have certain primary parks uh, where they should be focusing their attention. And again, it spans the broad spectrum of um, code and zoning and law enforcement as well. Likewise with the uh, environmental services personnel inside of the public works department who are also licensed deputies and who can cite and what have you. And so that's, that's not infrequent inside of our, our city responsibilities on, on what one's uh, purpose truly is. I just wanna make sure um, we're getting it right. And as Councillor Anderson mentioned, uh, what is our level of need? And we have to always look at our budgetary resources on that. Um, but I, I think taking our current employee and uh, expanding their ability is is kind of what the discussion we had originally in the budget committee and not locking them down so hard. Councilor Kaser. Thank you. Uh, I go back to, I think the, the attachment on the staff report, there's an attachment for the job duties of the park ranger back from 2016. And it says right up front, you know, the, the best use of the position is uh, the result is staff discussions on how best to use the position to address the security needs of the park system. And to me, that's different than reporting junk vehicles and um, that sort of thing. And it goes on to specifically state kind of what the day-to-day -day duties are. Um, and, I, and I guess the, the question before us is, it's not just can we expand the park ranger to serve all the parks, because that part I don't have an issue with, actually. I, I agree with Councillor Nanke. I think he should be allowed to go into any park and to build uh, relationships there as best as you can as one person in 92 park properties. But I think the problem is, is expanding the duties to be to to include things that other other code compliance specialists can do. And I, and I get that we are deficient in that area service delivery wise, but I'm not sure the park ranger is the right the right place for that or the right position for that because that's not what originally was established to do. 
And I know we need to be flexible. We need to be amenable to change and, and all of that. But um, I'm concerned about losing that position to do a lot of other types of enforce enforcement, like junk vehicles. And I know they do junk vehicles. I saw the park ranger and a code compliance person at Minto Brown not a couple months ago dealing with a junk vehicle. So I know it's I know it's a problem. I'm just not sure that this is the right the right position for it. Um, I would also really like to see. I didn't know the park ranger had moved departments, and I don't know why. That seems odd to me that the park ranger is not with the parks division of the city. I I would like I would like to know why that is. That you would, don't answer that now, but if you come Councilor, back, to Councilor Hoy, would you like to put in a substitute motion just to maybe table this to our next meeting and get a a, a more complete staff report? All right. Maybe you could even work with Norman or other counselors with interest with Suzanne and Norman to kind of find that what everybody's looking for here. That would work perfectly for me, sure. You want to make that? So I'll make, a, I'll make a substitute motion. I move that uh, this item be tabled and referred back to staff. I'm sorry, just referred back to staff and for further work to be brought back to us at a future date. Second. Second by Osik. Is that you? Yeah. Okay, it, it was. was. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in will be counted by the recorder. <laughs> hey, Councillor Osik. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Lewis. Aye. Councillor Kayser. Aye. Councillor Anderson. Aye. Councillor Nanke. Aye. Councillor Leung. Aye. Mayor Bennett. Aye. Okay, the motion passes unanimously. We'll see this one again. Okay, that moves us to information reports. Anyone want to have some information? Councillor Kayser. Thank you. I have a question for staff on item 6.E. This is an appeal of the site plan review decision for Grant Elementary School. Um, and the question is, so Grant has appealed the decision of the, is it staff? Was it a staff decision, administrative decision? Is that correct? Uh, uh, the, you're, the appeal that they're making, yes, it is on a, it is on a staff decision. A staff. The, the staff report should be attached, yeah. Okay, so if they appeal, it's gonna go be appealed to the hearings officer, is that correct? That is correct. And then, Unless, and then, so this is my question: If it's appealed to the hearings officer, I believe that it stops there. Whatever the hearings officer's decision is, that's the final. Council cannot call it back up. Yes, that is correct, Councillor. Uh, unless Council decides to hear the appeal themselves instead, in which case it would come back in August, probably the August tenth meeting, but sometime in August. Okay. Uh, I guess I would move then to to um, to hear this appeal, the site plan review decision for Grant Elementary School. Second. Second by Hoy. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, the reason why is um, I know I know this has been very very contentious. Uh, I know the neighborhood association has they've spoken with the school district a couple of times, um, but there's no. I know from their letter to that, uh, I think co-chair Sam Skiller and submitted, um, I think they're looking for solutions here and not feeling like the school district has presented them with a whole lot of options. Um, and I think we, you know, I'm frankly, I'm surprised we haven't seen more of these out of all the bond work from the school district. So I don't know if we've actually reviewed any, but I do feel like this is one that we should take a look at. Um, given the impact that that would have um, directly on the neighborhood and given the um, cumulative impacts over the years within Grant School. Um, and just full disclosure, just transparency, but my husband's a co-chair of Grant Neighborhood, um, but he did not submit this letter, so. Councilor Anderson. Thank you very much. Um, I had, uh, in response to Councilor Kayser, in Ward 2 at South Salem High School, there were some concerns about the site plan, and I called it up as opposed to going to the hearing officer. And in the interim, 
the without any involvement by me except to urge them to do this the neighborhood it was a scan and also um, a particular neighbor it was Lori Walker and others down there and they met with the school district and came up with a good compromise solution and that appeal was withdrawn because the issue was resolved uh, uh, between the neighborhood and the school district. So I would uh, urge uh, Grant Neighborhood and the school, uh, school administration to get together and see if maybe something can come of this before it comes up to us for appeal. Thank you. Councillor Kayser. Well, yeah, and if I can, thank you, Councillor Anderson. And I I hope that they continue to do that and from both the uh, the decision and the school board's letter, the grants letter, I mean, they have met. I think the meeting that never happened was between this district, this uh, grant neighborhood and the city. And I don't know why that wasn't able to ever happen. Um, I'm sure the pandemic has something to do with it, but um, that's the thing that concerns me too, is that meeting couldn't, couldn't happen i don't know why but 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 i would i would hope that that's the case too that before this comes to council that they could work something out ahead of time and i just don't know if i, I yeah I, I just know that i know that grant neighborhood wants to work with the school district and they have for years and they're in a very tight spot literally in a tight spot with that school um and i just think we i, I think we um it would be prudent to, to hear this given the circumstances. Councilor Nanke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, and I, I agree. Uh, a lot of times I'm kind of hesitant to pull things up for council consideration, but it's already scheduled to go in front of someone. So we just need to make sure that we have our hearings officer um, ears on and, and that we're making sure that we're making our decisions based on uh, criteria as well. Just dropped in at the last minute. Again, a lot of these parties can settle these outside of that. And so um, I'm more than happy to, to hear it as a council and to give them the opportunity to uh, try to address their grievances uh, prior to coming before us. Okay, anyone else? All right. We call the roll. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Lewis. Aye. Councillor Kayser. Aye. Councillor Anderson. Aye. Councillor Nakey. Aye. Councillor Leung. Aye. Councillor Osik. Councillor Osik. Going once. Oh, Mayor Bennett. I want to try Osik again. Sure. Councilor uh, Osik. Okay, there. great. Thank you. Okay, motion passes unanimously. Okay. Any other information items anyone wants to go over? Mr. Mayor? Yes. Thank you. I, I don't, re I, I, I'm looking at 6D and I don't really have to say much more than I said in response to that's the uh, performance audit uh, that I said in response to uh, the city manager's comments. I think this is a good thing, and I think it ought to be as expansive as possible uh, to include the issues that I discussed uh, in my earlier comments. Thank you. Councilor Nordyke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So at our last council meeting, I brought this performance audit idea to us. And the basic idea is that we have a lot of people right now who are interested in doing a deep dive into what policing means in terms of what kinds of tactics, what kinds of training, what kinds of responsibilities should they have. And it doesn't make sense to take into consideration the fact that a lot of folks are interested in having mental health professionals respond to mental health crisis. And our own police chief has made some comments to that effect and many others as well. And so I brought forth this performance audit and as we all know at our last city council meeting, we wanted more information in terms of what that performance audit could look like. And I very much appreciate what the city staff have put together for us. And I just wanna remind folks for those who were not paying attention at the last city council meeting or were otherwise unable to participate that this is an opportunity 
to improve public safety. And this is an opportunity to bring real and lasting change in a way that rejects knee-jerk reactions to policing, a way that avoids knee-jerk reactions and the unintended consequences that sometimes come with it. And what I want is an objective and a data-driven and a very public review of policing. An audit, performance audit, one that is conducted by a third party outside voice is something that can be fair not only to the officers but and to the department, but to the people that the officers serve. So that's why I had called for that performance audit. And I'm very pleased to see that the staff have come back now at our very next meeting to have this audit drafted up. I'm assuming that everyone has taken a look at the scope of work that they've identified. And briefly, it's research and assessment, review of best practices, which, for example, includes best practices for our protests and crowd control. We've had a lot of concerns raised about that. We've had a lot of concerns raised about how law enforcement interacts with unsheltered persons and individuals experiencing behavioral health crisis, and on and on. I'm not gonna go over the scope of work in great detail, but at this point, um, I'm very appreciative of the city manager's comments, and I want a process that is fair and open and transparent, and ideally something that can be completed by the time the citizen budget committee meets, because that to me is the best time for that project to be done. That should hopefully give us enough time to do it right, enough time to provide public input along the way, and enough time for the citizen budget committee. And I must reiterate, it is a citizen budget committee that is equally comprised of members of the public and the city council who make the recommendations for what our budget should look like. And so this is the reason why I brought forth this proposal. And I'm interested at this point, the recommendation that is set forth in your materials simply says information only or city council may choose to provide direction. And the direction I would choose to provide to the city management right now is to follow through with the proposed scope of work as addressed. But I'm happy to, I'd, I'd like to hear from my peers on what we all think about this. Obviously we can't have the conversation as a group outside of this meeting. So this is our first opportunity to discuss it as a group. But I think that to me, this is enough to get this process started and it will take time to do it right. And we can, at this point, I think, direct staff to move forward. And it says right in the report, if city council chooses to proceed with a performance audit as outlined in this report, a request for information will be used to provide a realistic estimate for consideration for the cost of providing the performance audit as well. So at this point, um, I would like to hear from my peers and I'm hoping we can entertain a motion to this effect because I see this as a real opportunity to do the right thing for public safety in our city. Thank you. Councilor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I just want to sort of underscore what uh, my colleagues have said so far. I appreciate the city manager's leadership here. I think that some of our the city's communication has created a little bit more ambiguity than it has addressed in the past. And I think that this report and this document, he clearly heard that and he addressed that in this report and he heard he heard what council said last time and i think he assimilated all that into this report and i think i'm very comfortable with the direction that he's headed with this uh with what he's outlined here i think it's uh, i think it's wise and i think it's important work and i i think he's really headed in the right direction and i appreciate what he's done here to kind of assimilate all these different conversations that are going on and move in a direction that the council has uh, suggested to him is important to all of us. And so uh, that's that's where I'm at with this. Thank you. Officer Nanke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and you know, the city manager responds very well to council's wishes. And so my recommendation would be to Councilor Nordyke to go ahead and make the motion uh, and then we can discuss it to pursue um, what staff outlined in their report and uh, see what comes back from an RFP. Okay, Councilor, do you have a motion that you'd like to make, Councilor Nordyke? I do. I move to proceed with the performance audit as outlined in the staff report. Second. Second by Hoy. 
Okay. I, uh, one area that I thought was somewhat missing in this that I've heard over the years that I'd be very interested in uh, because I view this as having multiple uses and one in particular is uh, providing uh, guidance and information to our new police chief who's going to be on board uh, at the point that this starts to become deliver, uh, deliverable uh, is a, looking, a look at staffing management uh, practices as well as patterns. Uh, this is something that I've heard about for 20 years on budget council and now as mayor that uh, there is, that it never hurts to take a look at how many patrol officers, corporals, sergeants, lieutenants, captains, deputy chiefs, and a chief that you have and what that configuration looks like as a, uh, as a management and service delivery system. So that's an area I'd be interested in, at least understanding a third party review of that, see what that looks like to share with that new chief. And I didn't see that there. I see some stuff that comes out of headlines. What I didn't see were some things I thought might be useful uh, to a new chief. Although I think all this will be too. I think it's a really good, uh, really good job by the manager. Councilor Nanke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, w along with your comments, it comes back to a span of control, how many people are underneath you and, and when does it become um, untenable as far as the amount of, of, of persons working underneath you that you can actually effectively control. And so um, I'm hoping that'll bring that out as well as far as uh, how that needs to be layered and um, and then again, all the other components that were identified in the staff report as far as how we're dealing with specific kinds of situations now. You know, the police are in a really untenable situation. A lot of times it's like, I'm dealing with this person, I have no idea um, what they're going through right now, which is why we put together the other program to where they have mental health professionals available uh, to accompany them. But, you know, we, we need to look at a full spectrum and, and how we're dealing with issues that happen inside of our city. And so I'm, I'm more than uh, happy based on what the price ends up coming to be um, and, and how we may tailor that down if it is uh, excessive. But we need, we need to get an RFP out there and, and see what costs look like based on our, our current um, request. Councilor Kayser. Thank you. Uh, I, um, I'll be supporting the, the motion here. I wanted to point out though, that one of the things I think is missing out of the scope of work and perhaps it's gonna fit under review of best practice and, and, and in the interview sections, but we do need something in there about a review of interactions with uh, black indigenous people of color um, because that's something that is at issue, at core issue right now in Oregon and the country and that should be specifically called out in the scope of work. Um, I know we have other groups called out here, especially interactions with unsheltered individuals and those experiencing behavior health crises, but we need to add in also interactions yeah. with the BIPOC as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd also like to add specifically under um, page three of four on number item number four, <clears throat> community interviews, that when we are, um, doing um, interviews with community leaders and potential partners that we're not just going to the same groups that we've um, traditionally always reached out to that we have to make sure that we incorporate the voices of other um, emerging groups as well as community leaders that are often overlooked um, i think that's very important that we um, incorporate that and that we take consideration um, their voices are amplified and that we have opportunities for them to engage whether in english or in their respective languages Hi, very good. Councillor Lewis? Yeah, um, real quick, I, uh, I've heard Councillor Nordyk mention this several times and I want to agree that um, time is of the essence and this certainly needs to be information that's back to us for the budget next year, but I believe it needs to be done as soon as possible. I look forward to the staff coming back with an understanding of how quickly it can be done, how thoroughly it can be done, and how much it will cost. That's the next step as far as I can see, but that I'd like to see happen as soon as possible. 
Yeah, and and that the deliverables come as they're finished. I mean, you kind of hate to, do we have to wait for the entire completed report or can we see in certain areas, uh, like the one outlined by uh, Councilor Kayser, which incorporates, I think, suggestions from Councilor Leung, could we see those kinds of pieces as they're being audited brought forward? I, I don't know how that works but I'd be interested in how much of this we can see in progress or, or is completed by section. Um, the other area, uh, I mentioned staffing again, we have consistently over the years uh, been told, and I, I believe correctly, but I would really like to understand it, that we are understaffed in our police department, that we do not have enough officers for the population or we're outside of a national standard. And I think understanding what that's all about would be very helpful for future councils to, to understand and maybe for the public to understand where we stand on some kind of continuum of police officers per thousand and whether or not that's a, that is a correct measurement of how to determine your police services. Uh, whether or not you're, you, you've compiled enough uh, police to put on the right show. Mr. So Mayor, I, I, if I may. Yeah. Uh, just to build on what you were saying, I, I agree exactly with what you're saying that we need to know standards and also with the new uh, information of how much should be on the plate of the officers versus yeah. on the plate of um, healthcare professionals. And so I think that's an important distinction is I have supported and agree with we're understaffed for police officers, but we're also understaffed wildly for healthcare <laughs> professionals who could help um, right unsheltered individuals. So making sure we keep that balance in mind as we go forward to say, if we're understaffed 100% with healthcare professionals and 10% with police officers, maybe we need to tackle the healthcare professionals first. So just yeah, keeping that well, in mind. You can only hope that's the way it'll end up. Uh, yeah, uh, Councillor Nanke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and just getting back to you know, a lot of times these reports can take a significant amount of time and talking about interim report updates and what have you based on those items that were concerned. I would I would hope the uh, city manager in crafting that could take some of those elements in, or just in the ordinance that comes back to us to try to find those pieces that are more important to us that we want an interim report on the upfront because otherwise we're gonna be sitting around or you're going to be sitting around because I won't be here by then um, to, to get the final reports and, you know, how, how we can improve or maneuver or manipulate the system to, to be more responsive to the needs of our community. Great. Councilor Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councilor Nordyke's motion is important and there's also another motion that I made to hold a work session to discuss the potential looking at the use of police or the non-use of police for social service issues and for addiction issues and for non-criminal issues. Specifically, uh, I, I discussed the issue of cahoots. I referenced that down in, in Eugene. <clears throat> and so I don't see that that work session has been scheduled, but it sure seems uh, yeah. These two ought to be combined. You want to just have this as part of the performance audit, the cahoots well, type? I, 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 I don't know. I think I, I don't know. I just think the, the city manager ought to consider that. Maybe it's better for just to have the, the cahoots social service issues uh, separately, but we're already uh, having, you know, various counselors have said how the police deal with underrepresented people and minorities and people on the streets. That's moving closely to the same uh, discussion I'd like to have about what is appropriate for the police versus what is appropriate for social service agencies. Mr. Manager, any thoughts on that? Uh, I know we've, United Way is working on a cahoots tie. I, I don't know where we are in this project being put together. So what, what's your pleasure on 
the councillor's suggestion. We get, get off the dime on cahoots. Council has requested two different things specifically. One okay. is a work session on non-police responses to, or actually police responses to non-criminal behaviors okay. and non-criminal status. And are there better ways for the community to be responding to those needs? Certainly information from a performance audit would be helpful for that discussion. This performance audit is going to take months to do. The work session may take month, a month or two to get organized, but not months to hold. So it's, you're, you're really requesting, you know, two things with different timelines. So combining them, I, I, it would really re then require some give on the timeline for the performance audit or um, delaying the work session, the second work session, because you also requested a work session on school resource officers. A work session, delaying that second work session until the information from the performance audit was available. So the sense of urgency uh, that, that council has for the performance audit and the work session on police response to non-criminal activities, behaviors, and status is, is I guess, guidance that I need because uh, they, they will be on different timelines. Mr. Mayor? Yeah, go ahead, Tom. I, I'm perfectly, that's why I wanted the input from the city manager. I'm perfectly happy to have these for right now proceed on two tracks because clearly the, uh, the non-criminal response issue is something that, that uh, we could proceed without an audit. And I think, uh, and the sooner we get to that, it's the better as far as I'm concerned. I think that okay. can be done a little quicker than an audit. And, and the SRO issue uh, is, is one that is so dependent on the school district trying to figure out where they're headed. Uh, and that appears to be on a really protracted, for at least for the summer, a protracted timeline. Uh, well, Mr. Mayor, it is dependent on the school district, but we've got a contract. And at some point that contract is running out. At it's running point, out, that's right. Contract it's, needs to be removed, uh, uh, renewed. And so that it's gonna come back to us at that point. Yeah, at that point, we will have the school district does. So. Well, and and if, if I may, the, the school resource officers is a very fluid situation because there's certainly a question whether schools will be reopening in the fall. And if schools are not reopening, if schools are being held virtually, there's there, there are no needs for a school resource officer. So that's also, I think, part of the, the considerations that are occurring right now uh, with the Salem-Kaiser School District. Okay. Well, we, we have uh, Councilor Nordyke's motion. The council or the manager has heard our discussion of other issues we think would be good in his ordinance or in his final report. Uh, did anyone have anything else they'd want to kind of interject? Yes, Councillor Nordyke. Uh, just briefly, Mayor. Um, I first of all, I really appreciate the edits, essentially, that both Councillors Kayser and Leon have recommended. Um, I'm fully supportive of. I think the city manager can obviously takes excellent notes and has heard our concerns, and so I I believe that in this motion, the city has the information they need to tweak it as needed to address. The additions that they raised. And I also want to reiterate what my other colleagues have said, which is that this needs to be a public process. And I think it's a good idea to perhaps have updates on how the performance audit is doing so that that way we are keeping tabs. We are making sure, are we talking to the community leaders who we want to talk to? Are we talking to the folks who need to be talked to? And it's also, every time we discuss it publicly, it's an opportunity for the public to be reminded that this process is ongoing, that they have every opportunity to email us at any point in time, to sign up for public comment, to be a part of this process. So I would encourage that, you know, if, if this motion passes tonight, this is not like, it's not like every single detail is locked in. We can and we should treat this as an opportunity to refine and, and tune it up as needed to, to uh, address all of our needs. But I do want to reiterate, um, thank you again to the city manager for drafting up the scope of work. It's greatly appreciated. I look forward to next steps and I'm ready to vote. 
Good. Well, that'll be back to us uh, as a as a, a separate a review. Is is that? Do I understand that correctly, Mr. Manager? I just want to make sure I understand what happens next. Are you bringing us anything more on this this audit? Uh, I, oh yeah, yes. Uh, okay. I, I I am understanding Councillor Nordyke's motion as proceeding with an RFP. I okay. heard the request from at least one counselor for information regarding budget and, and scope of work. So if this motion passes, I will proceed with an RFP as soon as possible and provide an information report to council to keep council and the community updated on the, on the scope of the RFP and the mm -hmm. estimated cost. And at, at some point in the future, I will need to bring a budget amendment to council to fund uh, the performance audit. Well, thank you, Mr. Manager, for the work to, to bring this to us in such a timely uh, in timely manner. This really has gotten to us, I think, really quickly, given the amount of other things going on. Uh, let's call. Is OK to call the roll? Nobody has anything more to say? OK, let's call the roll. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Lewis. Aye. Councillor Kayser. Aye. Councillor Anderson. Aye. Councillor Nanke. Aye. Councillor Leung? Aye. Councillor Osik? Aye. Councillor Hoy? Aye. Mayor Bennett? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Do we have any, anything else under the information reports? Nope. We'll move on then to the first reading. Ordinance Bill number 820, an ordinance relating to stormwater and floodplain overlay zone, amending SRC 70.005, 71.090, 095, and SRC 601.070. And we'll need a motion. Councilor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move the City Council conduct the first reading of Ordinance Bill Number 8-20, amending Chapter 70 Utilities, Chapter 71 Stormwater, and Chapter 601 Floodplain Overlay Zone of the Salem Revised Code. And after a public hearing, advance it to second reading. Second by Lewis. Discussion. All those in value will have a roll call on this one. Uh, Councillor Lewis. Aye. Councillor Kayser. Aye. Councillor Anderson. Aye. Councillor Nanke. Aye. Councillor Leung. Aye. Councillor Osik. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Mayor Bennett. Aye. Okay, motion passes unanimously. Next. Ordinance bill number 920, an ordinance relating to system development charges amending SRC 41.095.097.41.110.41.120.140.150.160. Mr. Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move City Council conduct first reading of Ordinance Bill 9 20, amending Salem Revised Code Chapter 41, and advance the Ordinance Bill to second reading for adoption. Second. Second by Lewis. Okay, any discussion? All right, if you'd please call a roll. Councillor Kayser? Aye. Councillor Anderson? Aye. Councillor Nanke? Aye. Councillor Leung? Aye. Councillor Osik? Aye. Councillor Hoy? Aye. Councillor Nordyke? Aye. Councillor Lewis? Aye. Mayor Bennett? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, next one. Ordinance Bill number 1020, an ordinance ratifying the creation of, of an intergovernmental entity. I move City Council pass Ordinance Bill number 10-20 to ratify the creation of an intergovernmental entity to support the Mid-Willamette Valley Homeless Alliance. Second. Second, uh, second. second by Nanke. Discussion, I just briefly, I've appointed Councillor Hoy to represent City of Salem. He agreed generously to give up his time. <laughs> I'm very happy to be involved in this uh, really important yeah. initiative. And Done a great job so far, Councillor. Thank you. Okay, all those in, we'll uh, go through the roll. All right, Councillor Anderson. Aye. Councillor Nanke. Aye. Councillor Leung. 
Aye. Councilor Osik? Aye. Councilor Hoy? Aye. Councilor Nordyke? Aye. Councilor Lewis? Aye. Councilor Kayser? Aye. Mayor Bennett? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Have no, that's it, right? No more, no more. Correct. Well, I don't see anything left on the agenda, so we are adjourned. Thank you.